Bedfordshire Police applied to the High Court and the High Court agreed we need to ban Paul Golding of Britain first from Luton for five years. There's, you know, according to the security services, there's over 50,000 known wannabe jihadists walking the streets of this country. Mm. Over 50,000. They said, we can't do surveillance on all of them. It's literally me and about two, uh, two other people I didn't even know stood on that corner as Anne Jim Chowdhury was approaching and said, you're not passing. You're not getting past us. Fuck it. I'm going to die right on this spot right now. <laughs> he is not passing me. They tore you to shreds. I mean, they absolutely tore you to shreds. They drag you through the gutter. They made you out to be a, a, a you know, Hitler worshipping Nazi. There was 35 of us. If you include Britain first and the EDL together, there must have been 35 of us versus 2,000 Muslims. And directly behind us were two high rise flats. And all of a sudden, bang, the police car in front, police car behind, police cars up the side. The police cars everywhere. We're surrounded. It's like an SAS ambush. It's like, what the? going on here. I think just learning, becoming aware of our national identity, our history, our culture, our traditions, what a great country this is, everything that's been sacrificed to make this a great country. I think that just flipped the switch. Information covered up, censorship, corruption. The mainstream media have proven itself to be untrustworthy. I'm here to give a platform for debate, for truth, for open discussion. I'm introducing you to my podcast, Silenced, with Tommy Robinson. Who exactly is Tommy Robinson? Or Stephen Gatsby Lane? Of the English Defence League, the EDL. The problem is with Islamic radio. The English far-right Islamophobic act. Since then, there's been organised protests across the country in London, Manchester, Leeds. People in their thousands are marching for what this Paul Golding first got involved in politics in 1999. He was then elected as a local councillor in 2009 for Swanley Kent. Paul is a Christian and in 2011 he founded the Britain First political movement. Paul has risked his life many times confronting dangerous Islamic extremists and convicted terrorists. The authorities have tried every trick in the book to try and silence Paul. High court injunctions, probation orders, bail conditions, post-sentence supervision orders, and even prison. Despite the constant setbacks, prison terms, and social media censorship, Paul has rebuilt Britain first to be the most active and most energetic patriotic party in Great Britain. Welcome to my latest edition of Silence, my podcast, where the latest guest, literally everything you read about me online, you can replace my name with his name. Every accusation, Every rumour, whatever the government say, the attacks, the slander, you could just replace our names. I thought it's important that we sit down and hear his life story, understand who he is. He's someone that I didn't really get on with at the first, when I first started my activism, when he had his organisation. But then recently we've become good friends. So, Paul Golden from Britain First. Thank you for joining me today. Oh, it's a pleasure. I've been around for 25 years now and I've never done a podcast. This is your first Not ever once. podcast? First ever podcast. You see, I think that's incredibly important in the sense that otherwise people just make their mind up on who you are based off little clips of you. Yeah. Out of context clips many of the time as well. Mm. Well, we've all had uh, family members and so on that have Googled you, Googled me, and they, if, you, if you rely on the mainstream media, you'll, you'll just get the complete, complete wrong impression. But thankfully, we've got our social media back and we're able to fight back now. We are. I, I've met people before where I've been out for a couple of days I've been at, at this fitness camp and they haven't known who I am. And when they found out who I am, I've had to say, please don't Google. Like, mm. Please don't yeah. Google me. Because if you Google me, you're not going to walk back in and talk to me. Because when, when you read the accusations on Google, it doesn't portray the person I am. I know it doesn't no. portray the person it, you it, are. It's Google, it's the media, it's Wikipedia. Uh, and Wikipedia is just a dictionary of all the smears in the media. Put together. Yeah, chronologically. Uh, yeah. Uh, it's just poison on top of poison on top of poison. And if, if uh, you can't blame people, if they, if they Googled you and they Googled me, then you can't blame them for thinking that we're like, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I think we're just lucky now that a lot of people don't trust the media or trust the internet. I think that uh, Donald Trump has come along and he's, he's just repeating over and over again, the fake news media, the fake news media. It's worked. Because before Donald Trump, we never had this term fake news and all this other stuff. No. And he has just chipped away at it. But I think people, you know, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, when immigration wasn't really in your face like it is now, uh, 
But yes, obviously, you grew up in Luton, I grew up in South East London. Uh, I've been to Luton many times, as you know. Uh, I think I'm the only band from Luton. I'm the only politician who, by order of the High Court, was banned from going into Luton for five years. For nothing. It's not, not even walking not, down the street. Not even like you can't go into London now mm. because of your bowel conditions. Yeah. I couldn't go into Luton because Bedfordshire Police applied to the High Court and the High Court agreed we need to ban Paul Golding and Britain first from Luton for five years. Well, worrying trend though. And they also banned me from every mosque in England and Wales in the in the league. We'll get on to all this. That's because you were caused that we'll, we'll get on to that. I think yeah. it was the fabulous work you was doing. But you were blowing up at the time. Well, it's right. Me, me and you never used to get on. No, you no. used to run the English Defence League and I used to run Britain First. And there was so much bad blood. And I, I, used, to have, I used to have... People used to want alignment with anyone. I'd say, we're, in, we're the English Defence League. We're not entertaining anyone or anything. That was my motto from day one. Mm. So no other groups. We had different groups. I just used to be, keep them away. We're going this way. Yeah. And obviously we had a different start. We had a stance where we was just really tackling Islam. We didn't want to, I didn't want to talk about other issues. Probably, I look, I look at it similar now to where Nigel Farage went with Brexit. He just wanted yeah. to talk about Brexit. Yeah, he was, he was like a, a one issue, one trick pony. And that's what we Sorry. wanted. That's what I wanted. Because yeah. I thought if I try and divert attention to covering, there's so many other problems, then it'll weaken our message on this. And this is the, what I saw as the biggest threat. Well, I think back when you launched the English Defence League, like the, the issue of Islamic extremism was a lot more prominent back then. Yeah. Whereas nowadays, the big issue now is immigration. Yeah. I think that the, it's, it's swapped around a little bit. A uh, big issue for everyone now is immigration as opposed to Islamic extremism because they have pretty much done a good job in locking most of the Islamists up, like the, the hardcore top representatives, you know, even and, like Anjim Well, Chow at the time, there was a big vocal on the street movement yeah. of Islamists, weren't there? Yeah. They're all gone. They're all gone and they've also done a good job at censoring and silencing any critique of Islam. So I've watched as Islam's become quite fashionable in the recent years, yeah. with lots of converts, lots of hot influential people doing Oh, you see it on TikTok all the time. Mm-hmm. You go on TikTok every day, you're scrolling, you're guaranteed to come across at I least two, two white converts. Mm. Some, some of them are rapping, some yeah. of them, are, they're really embracing it. Yeah. I think that's all push though. I think that's all money. I think that they're being approached and given financial benefits like Sneeko to push, push Islam. And they get. I think that I think that when you think about it, Muslim Islam and Saudi Arabia, Qatar, all these countries used to fund mosques and yeah. they'd fund dawah stalls to get out and promote and convert people. Yeah. That shifted. That's not the way to convert people anymore. This is the way to convert people with Absolutely. influencers. Yeah. So now they're funding the influencers. Well, one of the things Britain First was quite well known for is as our mosque invasions. Yeah, we get, we we still get that. Ten years on, we still get, oh, this is, this is Britain first, the ones who invaded the mosques mm-hmm. and all that. But to be honest, we only invaded a handful of mosques over a two-month period. Can we, and can every we... single one of those mosques was, justified. was connected in some way to extremism. Yeah. And we thought that was a legitimate approach at that time. It was legitimate, because mm. no one else was talking about it. Yeah. Can, can we rewind before we get on to all the I've gone through all the crazy stuff you've been involved in, the prison sentences, the, the uh, terrorist attacks, everything. Can we start at the beginning to understand who you are? Where was you brought up? I was born and bred in South East London, uh, right out on the outskirts of Greater London. I was born and bred in a town called Erith. No, uh, it's sandwiched in between Bexley Heath, Woolwich, Bexley Heath, yeah. uh, Dartford with the Dartford okay. Bridge and all that. Uh, it's, when I was growing up there, it was a lovely place to live. It was poor, it was working class, but it, well, I grew up uh, playing curbsy, playing football, playing manhunt. Kids still play curbsy? Uh, I don't know that's if they do we still. Used to play as well. <laughs> <laughs> but that, that's my, my entire youth spent growing up there was pursuits like that, yeah. hobbies like that. Uh, And then a few years later, it all changed. My younger brother, uh, who's three years younger than me, so there's not much much of an age gap, but when he got to my age, uh, sort of like started secondary school, it was all, you know, knives, hoodies, gangs, The gang culture. Yeah, that just creeped in and totally changed everything. Uh, But like I said, I grew up in a a rough, working class uh, area of South East London. And when I was growing up, it was almost exclusively English. Yeah. 
There was no, no immigration at all. I go back there now, it's completely unrecognisable. I mean, I just, I just don't recognise it. All of the families that I grew up with on, on this one road have all moved out into Kent or to Essex or to Surrey and so on. They've all moved out. White flight? White mm. flight. All of them. And it's just been replaced. Thankfully, it's all been replaced by African Christians. Okay. The place looks unrecognisable, but there's, there's no... There's no uh, the, that whole gang culture, the knife crime, it's all gone. Because now, the immigrants in that specific area are all African, African Christian. Christians. Who are, who are families, good have as their gold. fathers. Good as gold. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's so, uh, it's, it's not a particularly notorious area. No. Uh, but like I say, you know, the, the Westminster elite and, and the, the journalists and, and, and so on, they've all grown up uh, with a silver spoon. Uh, they, they all come from wealthy areas. They're all middle class. Yeah. But there's people like me and you who are leading the opposition in this country to what's happening, all the big issues. Uh, and we come from quite humble working class backgrounds. What was, um, did you play football? Was you into football? Fo no, I was never into football. Boxing? I'm still not. I, I despise it. I hate it with a passion. I've always been I into, do now. I've always <laughs> been into combat sports. I've always been into boxing, as a child boxing, as well. MMA. Yeah, growing up, always been into things like that. Never interested in football or rugby or anything like that. It's always been, because uh, I, I, I grew up with, in my area there was a lot of gypsies in that area, travellers, yeah, yeah. uh, and I grew up with a lot of them. All my old friends, a lot of them uh, are all travellers. Uh, Irish travellers? English no, travellers? No, no, they're English travellers. Yeah. Uh, actually, uh, Billy Joe Saunders, he's a friend of yours, I think. Yeah, yeah. His family over that side of the okay. water, I grew up with them, Saunders. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, a big family on my road. Okay. Um, but I was, I was quite glad because we, that they had a great culture, in my opinion, because... I, I, we, I agree, because they always get put down, but all the Trapper families I know are great people, great well, family they, people. They always they get always... married, they always had loads of children, <clears throat> and, but it's not just that, it's the ethos between the men, which I, which I grew up in. It actually shaped me to a, to a large degree. That's what got me involved if you've boxing, got problems, sort of MMA, tyre boxing, is that they would make sure that if you had a problem with someone, that it would be a fair one-on-one -on -one straightener. That's what it, That's gone now. It's all, it's all completely gone. When, like I say, when my brother hit his mid-teens, they was knifing each other, they was doing drugs, they were stealing cars. Mm. It just changed like that. Is that, that. What do you think changed it? I have no idea, but it just came in. Obviously, when I was growing up, that kind of culture was just up the road in places like Woolwich and Plumstead. So it's only like 10 miles away, 15 miles away. But then I see it, it's, it's taken over the whole of London and we can see it with the knife crime statistics these days in London. We see it on the news every day with Sadiq Khan. So much knife crime, they're all stabbing each other. Okay. It's a real toxic, horrible culture. And I saw it in my youth. It just went from one thing where he was playing man on. He had like 30, 30 kids playing man on. I used to love it, man. Yeah, it was I used brilliant. used to love it, man. Yeah, we, we used to play cricket. We used to dabble in everything. Yeah, yeah. We, uh, we, used, we used to ride motorbikes around the marshes in, mm. in, in Erie from Slay Green, right? But, but it was all completely harmless. It's what you expect kids to do. And then it just changed. And Lon like that, in London, this is the, from the, the centre all the way out to the M25, where I grew up. It's just a, a war zone. It really is bad. I do feel sorry for. Even the, the young black kids living in London now must be a horrifying experience. See, I see that culture. I've, I've, I see, I've seen exactly what you're talking about in Luton. But I'd say a lot of it stems from, and even my son's generation now, I see it. There's five stabbings a week in Luton. Yeah. But I'd say a lot of it comes from the culture of the music. A lot of it, I think, is celebrated in the music. When I listen to yeah. some of the songs they're listening to, yeah. that are mainstream songs, yeah. they're celebrated. All the gangs are celebrated, the violence is celebrated, the drug dealing is celebrated. It's like this America, it comes from America, because it's, 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 they say wokes come from America, don't they? We've imported critical race theory and woke, we've yeah, imported yeah. it all from America. Well, the first thing we imported was this, this uh, uh, barbaric ghetto culture of crime and glorification of crime and violence. And if you're sitting as a 10, 11 year old, 12 year old, you listen to that all day. Yeah. All day. That's what I see as a problem anyway, I've spoke to my, my own son about it. But I was happy. When I grow up, I, 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 had, I had a brilliant childhood, a brilliant youth. I, I think that uh, when I hit 16, and I don't know why, it was like a traffic light going from red to green. It was just like that. I started being interested in what was happening to the country. Which is, which is rare at 16. Yeah. Very rare. Yeah. 
Was your father interested? Were your parents interested? No, my, my parents may have had something to do with it, not directly, but they are a white flight family from South London. So they'd already left one area because yeah. of the immigration problem? They grew up in uh, Campbell, which I think is in the, the news the last couple of days, there's been riots between Ethiopians and Eritreans. Oh, I've seen there. it, yeah, yeah. yeah. So they, that's their, they grew up there. They born and bred Campbell, South London. And when my mother fell pregnant with me, they went, right, we're moving out to the suburbs to get away from it. Or the whole family moved out to the suburbs. And then the same thing happened one generation later. I'll go back there now, it's completely unrecognisable. And it'll keep happening. It's, it's, it's just a process, isn't it? Mm. Just pushed out and pushed so out and pushed out until we got our backs to the sea. How did you do it at school? I don't know. Ways wise? <laughs> Nothing. Nothing? Nothing at all. Uh, I taught myself, my, taught myself how to, to uh, write properly the English language. I taught myself all that. I taught myself uh, how to create websites, how to do all the technology uh, designing. I taught myself all that. I didn't learn anything at all from education. Most of the time in secondary school, uh, Bexley Secondary School, I used to bunk off almost every day. I, was not, I wasn't interested at mm. all. Got no education whatsoever. I was always down to snooker all. I was mm. far more interested in snooker than I was in, uh, you know, getting GCSEs or anything like that. I can't remember getting any qualifications whatsoever. No. No. Because I literally came out of secondary school. What did school. you do when you left school at 16 then? I left school at, uh, at 16 and then got involved in politics straight, straight away. Straight away. Straight away. And how did you get involved in politics? It's, how, a, it's how, a long time ago. It's 25 years ago now, so it's hard to remember specifically what were the triggers and all that. What, was the, what was the process of what did you first do? Did you first go, was it, did we have the internet back then? Did you get a leaflet? What, what, what was it that brought you to, I believe, you, is that when you joined the British I, I National Party? I, I think I was just natural. I've always been naturally interested in history. I've, 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 I must have read 2,000 history books in my life. I'm still reading all the time now. And I think just learning, becoming aware of our national identity, our history, our culture, our traditions, what a great country this is, everything that's been sacrificed to make this a great country, I think that just flipped a switch. And I think this is why they don't teach in British history, history in yeah. schools. I think that's why, because they, they don't want people like me or you Knowing who they being are. created. Because if, if you don't know what you're losing, you're, you're not going to be bothered when it's gone. You won't fight for it. You won't fight for it. So if you want to... If they did teach British history in school, I'm talking about the, the length and breadth of British history, so you really appreciated what's, what, what uh, has come before you, and that you're, you're just the latest link in an unbroken chain going all the way back to the dawn of history. If you knew that, and then you looked around at what these politicians are doing, uh, etc., then you would start to resist. You'd start to vote differently, you'd think differently. The, the, the establishment wouldn't last one generation. Mm. That's why they've removed British history from school. You, you learn rudimentary, you know, broad brushstrokes, but you don't really learn the core things that have made this country great, not, in, not even remotely in our education system. So what, what was the process, Paul? What was the process? What, what happened? How, did you join a political I th party? I did you... I came out of school and I'd, I wasn't interested in becoming a plumber or an electrician or a bricklayer. I wasn't interested. What my mind was focused on at that time was history, politics, all that kind of thing. And I looked around, there was nothing apart from the old British National Party. Mm. I actually joined before Nick Griffin was leader. I actually campaigned for Nick Griffin to take over because at that time there was a big battle within the old British National Party between 16's very young to be getting yeah. into politics. Yeah, and it's just gone like that. When you think about 25 it 25 years. About... It's just gone like that. <laughs> it's been a mad <laughs> 25 years, though, yeah? Yeah, it's been crazy. Um, Do you think we're in a better place now than we were 25 years ago when you started? No, I think it's, it's 100 times worse. Yeah, really is 100 times. But I think the tide's turning these days. But I think back then, I could just start to see what was going on. And it was just like a jigsaw. Do you know when you just put certain parts of a jigsaw together and all of a sudden you can see? I see it. And I thought, you know, immigration uh, and, and what everything that was happening, I just put it all together and I thought, do you know what? We need to stop it. This country is really in trouble. Like, I don't know why people become patriots, but they just do. Mm. Uh, and and uh, like, I think the trigger you said for you was the... Islamist extremism in Luton. Yes. Everyone's got their own triggers. Everyone's got their own reasons. I can't. For me, it was just, watch, just seeing, just seeing how they acted. 
Yeah. How different they were. Seeing, how them, they seeing them take the piss, basically. Yeah, seeing them take liberties, And then yeah. you thought, we've got to do something about this. And I can't remember, it was 25 years ago, mm. but it was something along the lines of, you know, mass immigration, everything was happening in the country, and I just, I just got sucked in. There was no internet back then. No. It was just, you know... Uh, so I joined the British National Party. I got a, a campaign for Nick Griffin to become leader because at that time it was a battle between... Nick Griffin wanted to make the British National Party he wanted to go down the route like the, the Front National in France, and he wanted to be, become modernised the BNP. He wanted to uh, become more sensible, start fighting elections properly, and try to make them an electoral force, try to make them a serious political party. And I thought, that's the way to go. That's exactly what this movement what, needs what to do. What did you know about Nick Griffin at that time, as a youngster? Nothing. Nothing at all. But I joined, and he was... Uh, basically the only option, because the, the, the alternative to him was, was, was John Tyndall, and that was basically, we need to stay like, like old National Front style, okay. s you know, sod, the, sod elections, uh, sod voters, you know, let's just stay ideologically pure and let's just stay how we are. He didn't offer any hope whatsoever, it was just more of the same that had failed in the 70s, 80s and 90s, and it was... But Nick Griffin said, let's copy what uh, Jean-Marie Le Pen's done, let's copy what they've done elsewhere, and let's try and bring that to Britain. So I thought, that's brilliant, that's exactly what we need to do. So from day one, even though I joined the British National Party, and it doesn't look great on a CV... I've had the same. You, you have had the same, I've yes. the same. It doesn't look great, but what else was there at that point? There was nothing. There was no... UKIP was completely non-existent then. I didn't, I didn't even know about UKIP till 2004 or something like that. Uh, you hadn't formed the English Defence League for another 10 years. Yeah. Um, so there was nothing. Apart from the British National Party, they were the only ones talking about immigration, talking about I think I, I, all the big issues. Like, I think I started the English Defence League in 2009, but in 2004 I joined the BNP. Yeah. I joined for 12 months. And there was, a, there was the leaked leadership, the leaked membership list that was, that was put out. Yes. And it showed for like six years or something. So it showed that I joined for 12 months, didn't rejoin. Yeah. When I joined, as I said, when you're drowning, you clutch at straws. And yeah. we were drowning. Luton was drowning, the country was drowning. Yeah. And I remember reading a 10-point page on, on a BNP leaflet. You might yeah. have even wrote it. <laughs> <laughs> it could, could well be. Yeah. It, was, it was 10 points on a BNP leaflet where I thought, well, I agree with that. Uh, heating for old British old age pensioners, agree with that. All 10 points, you'd yeah. have to be an absolute moron not to agree with. Yeah. So I joined got involved myself, I started looking, learning, didn't know nothing about Nick Griffin, didn't know it at the time, I didn't know any, no. as I said, I was just a young working class lad. And there's nothing else, is there? Is there no, there was options. It's not no. like you can choose, like mm. a, you get a menu in front of you, you can choose. Yeah. It's like getting a menu and there's one option, mm. that's it, that's all, the only option there was from 1999 to when I launched Britain first in 2011, the only option really was the British National Party, that was it. So when you joined 1999, how big was the BNP, how big did it become? Oh, it was tiny, it just, very, very small, 2,000 members, was very, tiny? yeah, it was tiny. It was, it was, uh, but to be fair, Nick Griffin did build it up, and in the end, under his leadership, they got two seats in the European Parliament, a seat on the London Assembly, 50 elected local councillors around the country. So he did manage to take it from, like, uh, from what it was in the 90s, which was pr pretty hardcore and pretty extreme. He transformed it uh, into a relatively successful electoral political force, but then completely messed it all up in the last year or two. On, um, news, on, on Question Time? Question... Was, was, that to, was that... What year did he go on Question Time? I think it was 2010. OK. Now, the establishment uh, played a blinder because they could see the, the British National Party rising. they just got uh, two seats in the European Parliament, seat on the London Assembly, and they're winning council seats, county council. It was really doing well. And they was becoming a real threat to the establishment. Uh, so the establishment played a blinder and said, let's get their leader onto question time. Now, at the this is one of the, one of the big things that made me uh, turn my back on Nick Griffin and the British National Party, amongst some other things. But it was, if you know you're going into that scenario, you do a lot of preparation. You do a lot of simulation, uh, and, and you go in there swinging. You go in there all guns blazing. Mm. You bash your hand he looked on the... Out of he looked out of place. He took the opposite advice, which was from one person. Go in there, look tame, look respectable, because 
then people will think, oh, the, the BMP is now, you know, mainstream. And you, we all watched it. Everyone's watched that episode of Question Time. Mm -hmm. He went on there, he was squirming. He couldn't get a word in edgeways. He was being, you know, there's people like uh, the Liberal Democrat panelist. He was, uh, he was done shortly after that for something police-wise. But at that time, he was claiming feather dusters on his parliamentary expenses. So I said, go in there. If he says one hostile word to you, him, just right? point your finger at him and say, I'm not, taking, I'm not letting you mm. take the moral high ground when you're claiming feather dusters on your parliamentary expenses while pensioners freeze. I told him to do all of this, and he didn't do any of it. See, my thing, I, I remember watching at the time when I was leading EDL, and I, I think he got exposed on there as a racist because he was a racist. So I think when, when given the opportunity on national TV to sit and people question him, He's standing by, standing by his own beliefs. That's, what, that's how I felt. If he would have gone in there as a man of the people, yeah. like Donald Trump, said, yeah. I don't care what these politicians say, all I want to do is put British people first, I want British jobs for British workers, put our elderly first, put our veterans first, he would have come out of that a national hero. Because one in every three adults in the whole country was watching. So if he'd have gone in there as a tribune of the people, like Donald Trump, he would have come out and he would have been a national hero. Instead, he went in there, done the squirming act, and just looked weak and feeble and unprepared. And from then, you see the BNP's fortunes on a timeline just bang down. What happened for you from then? Uh, it, it, took a long, it took a while for that to sink in. I remember, as soon as he left the studio... Was he you full-time? Yeah, this I, was, was I, was, I was a full-time employee. I was, at that point, I was director of publicity, I think, or communications director. How old was you? Uh, at that point, I was about 26, 27. Still young. That's still, young. Still, still very good. young, yeah. Um, but I remember as soon as he left the Question Time studio, he drove all the way down to my house in Kent to unwind, because I was the nearest person, the nearest house he could go to. So he came there with his security team. I, we, we made them all teas and all that. And I said, how do you think that went? Because I, I was a bit dazed. I was mm -hmm. like, what the hell just happened? And uh, he went, oh, it was a bit rough, but I think it was all right. And then the polls came out afterwards, and he, he, he clung onto these polls continuously. Uh, and, and the polls were like, oh, people felt sorry for him. Well, look, you, you're pitching yourself as leader of the resistance, leader of the Great Britain. People don't want to feel sorry for you. Mm. They want to follow you. They want a strong leader. So he, one in every three adults, one third of the adult population was watching, and he just completely blew it. And I think after that, it just went... What lengths? I've always been interested, because I know the lengths that the establishment went to to hammer and destroy the English Defence League. The English Defence League were a street presence. We weren't, we weren't testing them electorally, and we weren't a danger to them. What was going on to the British National Party? I would say... In those years. <laughs> now, you're no stranger. I'm no stranger to hope, not hate, style, subversion. Yeah. They pay people money, they get, them to, they get them That's to That's how they life. got the league list? Yeah. Obviously. That, it's all, uh, Who got the league list? Uh, yeah. That was slightly... Um, see, I, I actually left the BNP, then came back a year or two later, and it was... I just missed that. Okay. I joined just after. I rejoined just after. Um, that was a group of disaffected BNP traitors, basically, who tried to split the party. Um, and then they leaked leak the entire membership list. Which then stops anyone ever joining again, really. That's the whole point. It, they probably was offered a lot of money for that because that, that more than anything could have killed the party overnight. Well, I, say, I, I learned from that. I'm not joining that I learned because, from my, that. because my details will end up on the, in the Sun newspaper. I learned from that in the sense that I've never allowed anyone other than someone I've grown up with as a child to have yeah. access to that yeah. list yeah. because I know that they can But that was rough. damage. Mm. And that was rough. And this is one, probably one area, you know, we, we've got disagreements on certain issues. And one of the, one of the disagreements, I would say, is Julian Assange. Because you were always singing his praises. You was locked up with him, I think. Yeah. And, but I, I think Julian Assange is a total scumbag. What a traitor. He's a scumbag. He was the one who leaked the BNP membership list. I was leaked on his website. It was WikiLeaks. He leaked it. Now, what... what how are you fighting the state? How are you fighting corruption by leaking the BMW? Do you agree with what he did over leaking the illegal and the murder, the attacks that he showed? Yes. Do you support that? Yes, I do. So you just but, don't support the thing he does no, against BMP? 
I, I support him exposing government corruption, corruption and misdemeanours, but what, and illegal wars. What he did to the BNP membership was disgusting. Yeah, because he, he made those people a target. He made hundreds of innocent solid, people, decent, innocent patriots vi uh, victims. He made people, the, the left, the media, everyone. So many people, hundreds of people lost their jobs. The houses were attacked. It was mayhem for a long time. And I remember being in the middle of it and I just thought, like, Julian I wasn't Assange. Aware, I wasn't aware it was Julian Assange who'd done that. Well, you know, I haven't really, there's no point bringing it up these days, but um, as far as I'm concerned, yeah. what's happening to him now is, 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 in my opinion, considering what I saw in those days, hundreds of British patriot families having their houses attacked, losing their jobs, being targeted, victimised, demonised by the media, and just relentlessly targeted because they were on the list. Um, but do you, okay, even if you talk about that with Julian Assange, do you agree, do you still agree that, what's he done now, 10 years? Should he still be sat in, on solitary confinement? No. Regardless of it? No, it, no, like, no, I, I'm with you on all that. I get it, it, so it, you're, it, you're annoyed, because uh, yeah. so people understand, so people understand what happens here. If anyone's name gets associated, even with me, so the BNP would have got a worse time. But with me, you'd have a school teacher who would post a comment. Groups, groups and NGOs would find that school teacher's HR department, they'd contact his work, and they'd bombard until he loses his job. I used to have school teachers on the phone to me crying, yeah, saying he's a school teacher, he's a good, decent man, he supported my work, and now he's losing his job. But if you want to explode that by 100 times to what yeah. anyone who would have donated to the BNP, so Paul, you probably yeah. knew a lot of decent people, oh, ordinary hundreds. people. How many people in the BNP would you say were decent people and how many would you say were, I, I would were say, extremists? Because I've been asked this yeah. time and time again. Uh, and I have, to, I have to stress, I have to emphasise that I was in the British National Party because there was nothing else. Mm. There was no other option. Like I said, it was a menu with one option. That was it for a long time. There was no one else talking about against immigration. No one else talked. I remember when I looked in 2004, there was no one talking about Islam. No one. Well, you, you, you launched the English Defence League in 2009, that was focused on Islam. Yeah. Uh, Nigel Farage didn't talk about, his, uh, t t about immigration until uh, 2013, something like that. Okay. Before that, it was the British National Party. They were the only option, they were the only party that were talking about big issues like that. Mm. Uh, and that's why people like me were involved. I'd have, I would have much rather have been involved in something far more sensible, mm. more disciplined, and so on. But that's all there was back then. Uh, but yeah, the, the, I, I don't, I, I've never understood why Julian Assange leaked the BNP membership list because I saw the carnage and devastation it caused. Do you think that was him personally, or do you think there's a bigger team of people with him? There, there in might WikiLeaks? be. There and might many be. of those people in WikiLeaks, the sort of hacker sort of people, are of yeah. the left. Yeah. Many of that. That could be anonymous. the case. I mean, many of them are. I know it's in his name, it's like... It, it's, he's the leader. He's got to, the buck's got yeah. to stop with him. Mm -hmm. There's no need to do that. You're not, you're not bringing down a government agency. You're not exposing government misdemeanors, no, are you? I get it. By leaking a political party membership list. The, the devastation that caused was horrific, and I remember seeing it all. Mm -hmm. So I've never, I've always had quite a, a strong dislike of Julian Assange. Okay. So you've, got, you've come out of that. You've left the BNP. When did you leave the BNP? I left... I left the BNP in 2010, I believe, shortly after, about six months after um, the 2010 general election. What, what, why? The reason being, in 2009, Nick Griffin uh, and another BNP regional organiser were elected to the European Parliament. I remember. Now, the problem was that Nick Griffin was doing a good job at that point, mm. and he was steering the BNP towards being a serious political party with a lot of elected people. Uh, the problem is, when he was elected as an MEP, his focus switched from uh, the, the struggle on English soil, on British soil, to the European Parliament gravy train. And he spent all of his time... Oh, trying to get people elected as MEPs because that would have bought the party a lot more money. So is that what he started focusing on? No, no. He... No. he the, obviously, when we had those European elections, they're, they're run by proportional representation. Yeah. And, and you get... Uh, you get the leaflet distribution to every house in big areas for relatively cheap. So they're brilliant. I'm, I'm, I'm quite gutted we don't have them anymore. I'm glad to be out of the EU. But they were, real, they were great for up and coming patriotic parties to get onto a serious parliamentary level quite easily. Mm. Uh, but the problem with him personally, where he was going, one day he was going to the Black Country, to Barnsley, to Maidstone, speaking to 
branch, lo local people and branches. Jesus, his his focus was building up a political party on home soil. As soon as he was elected, his focus was indulging in the, chaviar, uh, the, the champagne and caviar lifestyle in the European Parliament, okay. doing his one minute speech. He didn't care about the back BNP back in England, okay. back in Britain. He, did, he, he completely lost interest. And because of that, uh, the, the, the BNP's fortune started to decline, coupled with question time. Uh, and in 2010, I just thought, I've had enough of this. It's not going anywhere. You can see all he cares about is going off to the European Parliament. Because in the European Parliament... Would you say it was the same about Farage and co? Uh, I think that they were doing it in a big way. But the main thing about people need they to... made it they made it so people there could do it do that so then they were yeah what, what the European the Parliament money? it does on behalf of the EU is it sucks in all of the radical upcoming anti EU politicians and neutralizes them in a dead With end money. because every every time you go to European Parliament Nick Griffin rented a house nearby and basically lived there full time every time he, he clocked in in the European Parliament went through security, they put 300 quid in his bank account. That's all he wanted to do. That's all he wanted to do was go to the European Parliament. 300 quid a day, 300 quid a day. I think they do this in the House of Lords. They do do it in the House of Lords. Yeah, yeah. so that was, the, that was the case. So he was just focused on that, just European Parliament problem. And it was just, it was nonsense mm. because the European Parliament has no power. No power at all. Mm. It's the European Commission that lays down the laws. So the European Parliament is the world's biggest talking shop they can't do anything. They can't even vote down any legislation. They can't say yes or no to any laws, nothing at all. It's just hot air. Mm. And because he was focused on that and he was, he was loving it, and I said to him over and over again, so did other people, you need to knock all this nonsense on the head, let's focus on the party here on home soil. Mm. He wasn't interested. It wasn't just me resigned. Dozens and dozens of senior people resigned. And it just went, it went south very quickly. Can I ask you, from the start of your BNP activism to your resignation there in 2010, what sort of police interference did you have personally? Because we're going to get on to what, current, what happens after this, but was you, was you police raided? Was you arrested at all in that time? No. You have no. To, uh, back then, mm -hmm. as you probably remember, in the early days of the EDL, it's probably the same. There wasn't, wasn't really much social media. It was no. very much in its infancy. The media was still very dominant. Yeah, they controlled. And they tore you to shreds. I mean, they absolutely tore you to shreds. They dragged you through the gutter. They made you out to be a, a, a you know, Hitler-worshipping Nazi at all times. Um, but back then, because we were involved in politics, we didn't really have much police harassment back then. It was mainly the media. The media was just tearing you apart nonstop. And it was, I would, I would hazard to say it's worse back then with the media attacking you than it is these days. Why? Than what we've been. I, I would say that what Nick Griffin went through at the hands of the media back then was worse than what we've experienced. Would you say, again though, I remember sitting when people say, well, what would it be like if you got on question time? I said, well, I'm not a racist. So any of the things they humiliated him over, they can't humiliate me over. Yeah. So anytime I've got ability to go on TV, you can't humiliate me for certain for accusations that aren't true. That's how I, so when I watched it, I just thought, well, that's all that happened was he got found out for what he is. Yeah. When he got the opportunity on TV, they found him out. And I think that when I've had a chance to go on TV, there's nothing they can say. I think there's two key differences mm. these days. Mm. Is that one, we've got social media to fight back. Yeah. We, we didn't for a few years, of course, yeah. but, but now we have. Any, anyone publishes any crap against me Can't or we? you, we can do videos, we can do rebuttals. Yeah. Uh, and I think that helps to a degree. That's why they took their platforms away from us in the first yeah, place, because they wanted to remove that ability from us. Mm. Um, and, but also back then, the other difference was the media was far more, I wouldn't say they were trusted, but they would take what they had to say was more, more credible, credible back then. I think these days everyone knows that they just lie, lie, lie 24 seven. It's just, everything they say is just rubbish and bullshit these days. But I think back then, at least say 75%, 80% of the population, if they called you a racist, people would believe it. Yeah, yeah, I agree. So that back then no. there was no social media and there was, a, there was a dominance of the mass media back Whatever then. Whatever the media said was yeah. taken as true. Can I ask, um, 2010 you said you left. 
Yeah. In 2009, the English Defence League emerged. Yeah. What I remember. Your, <laughs> what, what was your opinion? Because not because because I remember Nick Griffin gave a big statement, massive, a massive thing about it being a government agency, etc. And, and and what his argument was, which could people could believe, what his argument was was how can the street protest movement of young men form something with an identity that could go across the whole country this quick, this fast, with their own banners, their own their own emblem, their own all of this, so fast. That's what he put out and he said like, and, and no one knows who Tommy Robinson is, because at the time no one did. Yeah. What did you think as you saw it exploding? Oh, just, it's, 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 when, you know, when you know that man, yeah. you, you know what to expect. It's like, everyone who's not uh, part of his team is, is, is either on the Zionist payroll, for that's a good one, the Zionist yeah. payroll, uh, or their MI5 or Hope Not Hate. Yeah, we was MI5, it's, I, it's, I went from MI5 to Zionist. To, yeah. Uh, a not, not a day goes past, even these days, that get called a Nazi and a Zionist on the same day. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, on twi Twitter comments and stuff like that, it's, it's, it's ridiculous. But, uh, yeah, I think that the, the rise in the, in the EDL coincided with the collapse of in the, the BNP. BNP. Yeah. They both kind of... Uh, and then... Was you aware of um, the BNP infiltration of the EDL? No, not no. So, no. I was I was gone by them. Uh, I was so, ba the so basically, I, I, we found out that Tony, who used to be our our um, man who gave all, who who compared all the demonstrations. So I was literally all of a sudden getting it from everywhere, from all the regional organisers. We need to align with the BNP. We need to align with the BNP. Yeah. I mean, it was coming from everywhere. I was on a stag do. Where was I? I was in Latvia. Yeah. Yeah. I remember everyone, and I wasn't coming to this. This was the first demonstration that I wasn't going to because I was in Latvia. And my phone didn't stop and everyone said, mate, if you're not there, it's going to implode. You need to be there. Yeah. So I flew back. I to remember your speech. Do you remember the speech? I remember it because you said something along the lines, uh, this, this morning at 5am I was in a nightclub. Now I'm here with you guys. I was in a strip club. I remember that. <laughs> I remember that. Do you remember and it? I, but that, that was a few years after I left, believe it or not. That was a few years was after. It? A okay. few years uh, water had gone under the bridge by that point. And I remember the first time I spoke to you yeah. on the phone was when Nick Griffin was trying to worm his way in. Oh, they'd worm Do you remember? He's, he's like playing they'd... games and worming, winding you up and winding <laughs> Kev up and all this kind of stuff. And I remember the first time I spoke to you, I, deliberate, I, I specifically rang you up and I said, just ignore him. I know what he's like, just ignore him. Blank yeah. him. Because he, he'd got, I mean, from everywhere, all these people started saying we need to align with the BNP. And it felt like the English Defence League, all the people wanted to align with the BNP. So that was when I flew back. I flew back, I stood on stage, said, look, five bucks morning, I was here. Now I'm here. I need to ask you all a question. It's a very important question. Mm. Put your hands up if you want to align with the BNP. And not one hand went up. Yeah. So I thought, okay, so it's not the people in the English Defence League want to run the but BNP. But what he was up to then is... He was is, in everywhere. ...is the BNP was collapsing yeah. and it was losing relevance. He needed to align with a fiery yeah. street movement so that was getting all the attention. Yeah. He needed to bring himself back into relevance by... So he'd by spend, mu he'd spend months having meetings with my compare, having meetings with regional organisers, getting into all of them, offering them positions in the BNP, mm. so then if we aligned with them, then everything's great for all of them. I had to get rid of about I had to get rid of about another five people at that time. He, you're he, going, is, you're a, he is a slick he's, he's a slick operator. Yeah. He's, he's, he's very intelligent. Is he, Oxford, is he Cambridge? Yeah, he's uh, Cambridge educated. He, he's a very very cunning person, but he's also daft. Yeah. You know, he makes daft decisions. He aligns himself with daft daft yeah. leadership people. He appoints daft people. It's, he makes a lot of daft decisions, which you get with a lot of eccentric intellectuals. Yeah. Um, which it, he only got so far. What happened, Paul, from here for you? Because I, cause you're, we haven't got into any of the chaos that's in the air. By the way, this is Paul's <laughs> book, The Battle for Britain, and it certainly is a battle for Britain. And we're going to go through, I want to get into some of the dark and some of the chaos that's happening yeah. in your life. Yeah. You set up the British, you set up Britain first, did you? Yeah, well, what, what happened is I resigned from the British, the British National Party, and yeah. a lot of people resigned as well at the same time. Uh, a lot of good regional organisers and, 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 and key leadership officials and stuff like that. Yeah. So after about a year in the wilderness of just, you know, because you know yourself, when you're in politics, if all of a sudden it comes to an end, you go into like this, this you, you, you want to you go out and relax and probably go on the razzle and you want to just take, you want to have a, a good break. rest, don't you? Yeah, take yeah. a break. You need so it. we did that for about a year. Uh, and after about a year, we could see the British National Party was doing this. Uh, and we just thought, you know, that sooner or later, they're just, it's, it's going to be, they're gone. gone. They're not going to exist anymore. Mm. Fast forward to now, 2024, they, they haven't existed for years. Mm. So we was right about that. Um, but we thought, you know what? We've got all these contacts. We've got all these people, these activists. and like, let's, 
let's launch something fresh, something new, but let's do things properly. Mm. Let's do things properly because one, one of the, probably the biggest thing that let the old British National Party down was, it was the toleration of the bad eggs, the bad apples. Get rid of them. Neo -Nazi, like genuine neo-Nazis, anti-Semites anti and so on. They, they were tolerated. They were small in number. The vast majority. They're, they're so active, isn't they? The problem is Even the media now. focus on them, so that you get the impression yeah. that they are they the BNP, are but they weren't. The, Ninety-eight percent of the BNP were good, solid, working-class patriots, genuine people, um, and they were hurt the most with the the least the the, the, uh, the list leak yeah, yeah. of the membership list. Uh, but I remember back then, you know, we needed something new. In this country, because the, the, the idea was, it, we thought was quite niche. Mm. It wasn't political. It wasn't a broad spectrum of issues. Yeah. It was a, like a laser beam. It was radical Islam on the streets. Yeah. And he was like town hopping. So we thought, you know, what this country needs is like, which has a has a shelf life as well. For us, our, our political lives revolved around the British National Party. So we thought, let's let's build a new British National Party, but do it properly. Let's not let's not tolerate anyone who misbehaves. Let's not tolerate anyone who makes stupid, uh, does anything stupid or says anything stupid. Let's just get rid of them straight away. Let's see if we can do it properly. Yeah. Uh, and that's, we, we sat there, there was three founding members of Britain First. And at that time, it was actually uh, due to someone who was heavily involved in Britain uh, BNP administration at the time, they actually inherited the old BNP's headquarters in Northern Ireland. So we was all working... Is this Jim Dalson? Yes, Jim Dalson. What a rat. <laughs> what a rat, man. Do you know, can I, I'll tell my story on Jim Dalson. I've never met Jim Dalson. I, I got asked to go on a meeting with Jim Dalson. You were there? I was there, yeah. We went... We I, wasn't, I wasn't there. It was a two-part meeting yeah. that day in Bedfordshire. In Bedfordshire? I was there for the first part, which was quite innocuous. It was okay. just chit-chat. So I went out had a meeting with him and Anne-Marie Waters, and what we were talking about at the time was the Mohammed cartoons, because the Mohammed cartoons had gone on. We were talking, having this discussion, and literally, by the time... Say we had this meeting and we finished at 6 o'clock, by, like, 9 o'clock, there was breaking news story from Hope Not Hate that we were planning on instigating race-wise. So Jim Dowson, the big, uh, at the time, who, who was portrayed as his big loyalist in Northern Ireland, had openly admitted as well, being in contact with Hope Not Hate, so was working in, in hand in hand with Hope Not Hate, to give them this story that they could then pump around the, it went all over the media, that we were planning on instigating race riots, and the source of their information was Jim Dowson. And I've never, I haven't seen him since. I tried ringing him a hundred times, I said, you little rat, come and meet me. Because I just could not believe for what he'd been built up as. I remember it, I remember it well. Where, the, where, the cartoonist plot. The cartoonist plot. That's what so it was, the reality yeah. is, we didn't say that, but if we did, you're a snitch, you're a wrong one anyway. So your big bad, big bad man over in Northern Ireland, that's what I just couldn't believe. I just thought, hold on, this absolute clown is just a snitch who works with Hope Not Hate. Well, it was interesting because I remember I was on the other, I wasn't yeah. friends with you at the time. Yeah. I went and met you that day, yeah. but then they, they come and met you in the evening. With and, Am uh, and I think, uh, and it was me and Waters. Yeah. Waters yeah. So, uh, I just couldn't believe it. He came back from that meeting and he was ringing me up in a panic. These guys are MR5, they're trying to stitch me up, they're trying to ignite a race war, they want me to be a part of it, they want me to be... I was like, shit, that's really bad, Jim. Turns out it was all absolute rubbish. That's just um, an excuse for him to be working I, 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 must, I, must, I think I spoke to you about it yeah. years later, didn't I? But it was just, just rubbish. But, but the, what, was, what, was a, what, what it woke me up to was that Hope Not Hate, a room with everyone. Because at the time, he's clearly working on Hope Not Hate. For us, to have a, for us to have a social conversation at that moment, and then two hours later, it's on Hope My Hate's website, and the only person there is Jim Dowson. And he admitted, he admitted talking to them. And he's continued to, to this day. Yeah. He's continued to work alongside Hope My Hate to he, this he's, day. He's very close with Matthew Collins. Is it Matthew Collins? Yeah, Matthew Collins. Matthew Collins of Hope Not Hate. He's very close with him. They're on the phone, thick as thieves, almost every day. Yeah, he, that's yeah, that's yeah, he what I remember. But yeah, he so I haven't spoken to him, Jim Dowson, for, for many, many years. He I mean, masquerades as his patriot. Yeah, but it, I know, I remember him specifically. You remember, Jim Dowson left Britain first in 2014, so that was 10 years ago. Okay. I haven't been involved with him properly for 10 years. Mm. But I remember from 2014, probably up till 2019, I was still speaking to him. Yeah. And I know, I've seen it many, many times, he's thick as thieves with Matthew Collins of Hope Light, 100%. Which is mental, that's, that's treacherous. 
He's a traitor. He used to, he used to justify it by saying it was intelligence gathering, because Matthew Collins would blab his mouth and he would learn things. Uh, yeah, he, he, it, he is intelligence gathering for home, mate. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Getting their intelligence from YouTube. Obviously, with the, hind, the hindsight, the hindsight, the hindsight of what's happened in between. Yeah. With with other stuff, it, I can see that that, that that he was being a complete wronger during that period. Because you saw then, so if we get onto this, we'll get onto Jay de France. Yeah, it's a bit later on in the, yeah, in yeah, the timeline, so that, yeah, isn't so it? Yeah, let's talk through the timeline. But, but there was three of us in Northern Ireland yeah. in an office and we thought we're going to launch a new movement, we're going to try and get something going. And we sat there, I remember having the, you know, the boards up, the easels, we was writing different name combinations, what, what could we call this and blah blah. In the end we decided we'd call it Britain First. What people don't understand right is that Britain First, um, for the first three years, was, it was really hard. I mean, it was, it was tough. We was living in abject poverty. It was no support, no activists, no members, no donors, nothing. It, was, it, was, it existed, but it was completely, it was a nothing. And then everything changed in 2013, uh, because as we all know, Lee Rigby was killed in Woolwich. This was the behaviour. So, so there's it. literally, there's nothing I can sit here and talk to you about between 2011 and the death of Lee Rigby. It was just failure after failure after failure. It was really hard, it was really tough. We lived in poverty, like it was, it was tough. Talk to me about what happened when Lee Rigby was killed then. Well, we all remember, everyone remembers what they were doing that day. It's my son's birthday, I was sat at home, I watched it on the news and I said, right, well, I'm off. It's, like, it's a bit like 9-11, everyone remembers what they were doing on 9-11. Uh, so that happened in Woolwich and that shocked the nation. And I remember you went down there a couple of days later. We went there that night. All you no, that night. Oh, you went there that, that night. That was that night. I remember ringing around the lad saying, "Are you seeing this? Are they on the?" Because there was chanting Al Akbar on the streets. Yeah. After, after he was beheaded, there was a nearby mosque. There was claims going on online everywhere that groups of Muslims were out chanting Al Akbar. So that's when we said, "Let's go to Woolwich." And we went to Woolwich, and essentially it didn't look great for us. No, I remember it was like balaclavas and everything. Was, but, but, yeah, uh, we had about 100 English Defence League balaclavas. But um, the, the thing is, I, the reason that affected me so much is because I grew up down the road. Are oh, you in the next town on? I, I'm probably two towns down. Okay. Right? So you get Woolwich, uh, and then you get Abbeywood, and you get Belvedere, and then you get Erith. Yeah, so it's not far at all. I can be, if where, where I grew up, I could be in Woolwich in 15 minutes if the roads are clear. Okay. So that really did affect me. It really deeply affected me watching that unfold and it shocked the nation and it, it, it became a huge international event. The very next day, I went straight down there to Woolwich and I was there on my own. And I was looking, there was the forensic tents were up, you know, the police were all everywhere. And I just thought, pardon my French, do you know what, fuck it. I said, we need to do something about these bastards. Because, you know, before that we'd had 7-7 and there'd been but, but that was just beyond a joke. Mm. And you know yourself because you, you were launched into politics and you founded the EDL on the back of what these scumbags were doing yeah. in Luton with the East Anglian... Well, Ma Michael Adabalaja, we'd actually made a video about him in 2011. Yeah. Him personally. So they, they were becoming, they were running riot, weren't they? At that period. Unchallenged. They're all quiet now. They're gone. It, it's difficult, all gone. But back then, they were running rampant everywhere, especially in London. And there was lots of them. And I was there, I was looking at that, and as you know, the, the, the death of Lee Rigby affected me deeply because it was just a few miles down the road from where I grew up, born and bred. And it was a British soldier, and they tried to behead him. And then it was just wall to wall, and Jim Chowdhury, they, they were protesting, they were out on the streets, they were doing their Muslim patrols. Yeah. Remember those? Yeah, so targeting they, gay people, targeting yeah, they women. Were, they were out, and it was a big issue at that time. It was really, it was a big focus on radical Islam back then. So I just thought, you know what, fuck it. Let's get stuck into these bastards. So it took about, because I had no activists. You know, Britain First just existed as, as a name. It was just the name on a website, that was it. There was nothing else, right? And then one day, and Jim Chowdhury posted online and said he's going to march from East London Mosque up Brick Lane and it's going to be a protest against alcohol. They, you know, the, the, the shops on Brick Lane yeah, yeah, selling they alcohol. they target the shops when they tell the shop to, the Muslim shop selling, selling alcohol, selling yeah. alcohol I remember So uh, they met up on a, on a green opposite the entrance to Brick Lane. If you go across the road, there's a, there's a green where a big Victorian church used to be. So I went there and there must have been 600 Muslims on this screen. I mean, it's hundreds of them. It was massive. I was walking amongst them. <laughs> Just walking in and out of them. You fucking bastards. Like, what they were saying, what they were 
it was just unbelievable. Mm. I was so angry. And then I went across to the entrance of Brick Lane and I was watching. And then Anjem Chaji broke away with his group and he started walking towards Brick Lane. And I, on that corner, and I could show you the photo of it, it's literally me and about two, uh, two other people I didn't even know stood on that corner as Anjem Chaji was approaching and said, you're not passing. You're not getting past us. Fuck it. I'm going to die right on this spot right now. <laughs> he is not passing me right now. And you could, there's a picture of me. Send me the picture. It's in there. There's a picture yeah. of me holding a flag. A flag, I've seen it. Yeah, just holding a flag like You're that. You're holding it by your shoulder? In, in the no, face no, I'm holding it like this. Okay, okay. Right? I'm holding it there mm. on the pavement. And Jim Chowdhury and that lot, they're trying to get through. And I'm just stood there like that. I'm not, I'm not moving. Mm. Arrest me, shoot me, stab me. Oh, I'm not moving. Mm. And there was, a, there was a, a standoff for about an hour. And then uh, the police got in between us and all that. But I remember the footage, me walking up to Angie Tragedy and said, see you scumbag, I know where you live. I'm gonna find, I'm gonna come and see you. You'll be seeing more of me. And I walked off and I thought, I'm determined now to find out where that bastard lives. Uh, Which you did. Now, so I, I came away from that, I was on my own. I came away. Uh, little did I know, the video of what happened, bang, went viral. It was all over Facebook, it was all over Twitter, it went massive. And at that point, no one had heard of Brits, Britain first. It was just, uh, it was no man's land, it was dead. Uh, from that moment, that was the birth of Britain yeah, first. That was the first moment that people began to know about us. And it all, that's, that me just standing, blocking on Jim Chowdhury and about 20, 30 of his Islamist scumbag friends, uh, from there, it just started to take off. From that video going viral, got a lot of people contacting me out of the blue. And a couple of your, well, I say a couple, about 20 of your activists in the Dartford, North Kent area got in touch and said, we love what you do. Uh, we, we love what you did that day. Let's go and do some more of it. I said, let's do it. Uh, Paul Pitt, was it? No, no, it wasn't oh, Paul okay. Pitt, no. He never got involved. Uh, it was, uh, I can't even remember, okay. remember any of their names, to be honest. Mm. Uh, but we, we chose a pub in Dartford as our headquarters, mm. the Huffler's Arms, on Hive Street. And what we would do is we would meet in there, and I, 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 one of your previous guests, Johnny Mad Dog Adair, yep. I read his book and I read books about him and all that, and I really did, I liked the way they operated, because they kept everything tight, mm. uh, and they kept everything professional. I thought, that's, if we're going to do this, we need to do it that way. I said, I, I, I'll be honest, I didn't agree with what the EDL was doing at that time because it was just like, you know, uh, large crowds in t town centres. I thought, that's not effective. Mm. I said, what, what we're going to do is different. We're going to go to their houses. We're going to go to their workplaces. We're going to find them in the streets. We're going to go and charge their protests. We're going to make their lives a misery. Mm. And we are going to confront them, expose them. We're going to harass them. We're just, if, I want them to be... Coming out of their front doors, I think, where's that Golding? I wanted them to be looking over their shoulders. And this is what we set out to do. And we did it very professionally. When we met up in the pub in Dartford, no one had a clue what we was doing. I said, we've got an operation, or we've got several operations to do tonight. Meet up at seven o'clock, and then we're swinging to action. Thankfully, one of our activists, who's ex-EDL at that time, he had two decommissioned Snatch Army Land Rovers. Land Rovers. We thought, do you know what, we use them, they look great. And if, if, if they break down... in the middle, Because you, you look like paramilitaries. Yeah. You, you and look, we used to wear those jackets. You used to wear green bomber jackets. And we used to wear the flat caps. Yeah, yeah. We, looked, we, was, we was highly organised. Yeah. Um, but the first thing we did was we did a protest uh, in Clerkenwell. And I, I, I tried to think of the reason we were doing that protest. Clerkenwell, North London. On the, I tried to think of the reason on the way down here today. And I couldn't remember, but we did a protest... Uh, the first protest we ever did in Clerkenwell was something to do with Islamic extremism. And a woman came up to me out of the blue and said, Paul, go and check out Bromley Road, Leyenstone. I went, why? And she went, just go and check it out. Jealous. Who lives there? Right? I said, OK, cheers. And then uh, after the demo, I thought, we can kind of detour and go that way. I, thought, I hope it's not a long road, because if it's a long road, we're going to have to deploy multiple activists sitting in cars, like surveillance units, mm. to watch. Uh, but when I got there, thankfully, it was only f five houses on each side, so it was really short. Very, very short road. So I thought, I wonder who lives here. 
So I put a surveillance team uh, out there for three days solid, and they did three hour shifts. So, that, so you imagine like at the top of one end of the road, a guy in a car sitting there for three hours, mm -hmm. and then a different person would be at the other end of the road, in a different car, different person, looking for the next three hours, and three days of this, I get a phone call. You never guess who I've just seen. He's just walked into number one Bromley Road with his family. I said, who? He said, Jim Chowdhury. I said, brilliant, bingo. We've gone right to the top, the Islamist networks in Britain. We found the top dog, Jim Chowdhury. This was like really early yeah. in Britain first. We'd hardly done anything yeah. up to that point. Um, so I rang all of these ex-EDO activists, said, let's, get, let's meet up at the Uffler's Arms in Dartford. We've got something what very- year was, What year was this? This was 2014, okay. really early. This was like January, yeah. right? I said, uh, this was about uh, seven months after Lee Rigby. And I, I said, just meet me there. Trust me, you're gonna love this. When they all got there, we all jumped in the Army Land Rovers. We drove up to Leytonstone. We parked in a car park around the corner. Uh, no one had a clue what was going on. I best way, best yeah. way. I learned that off uh, Johnny Adair and C Company in yeah, the don't books tell and all them what that. Doing. Yeah. yeah, don't tell them what you're doing. So the very last moment, because they could send texts, they yeah, could uh, update late. Facebook, they could. And they, everyone talks. Yeah. Even if they're just talking to their mate, look what we're going to do. You've got 20 activists, one of them's going to be yeah. either loose lipped or he's going to be a wrong one. Yeah. Well, just by the law of averages. Uh, so, yeah, we parked up in a, in a car park around the corner. We knew what house he lived at. I had, I think, between 50 and 20 guys with me. Yeah, we had a loud, I had a megaphone. I said, when we all got to that car park, right at the last moment, I said, guess what, guys? Round that corner is number one Bromley Road. And Jem Chowdhury lives there. We're going to go and confront him. And they was, they, was, they was all over the moon like this. It was, it was a jackpot. It was brilliant. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and then, so we, you can see the old footage of it. We're all marching down, like a football firm, yeah, yeah. out of a football factory, all marching round the corner. We get to his house. He walks outside. No one's home. He's dead. No. What a wasted evening. Plus, these, these guys know he lives there now. They might go and put it on Facebook. Yeah. They might go and put it on Twitter. They might just tell someone innocently. It's going to leak. Um, so he's there for about 10 minutes. I went, come on, something happened. It was, it was a right anti-climax, right letdown. And then all of a sudden, I heard someone say, there he is! He's walk up Really alone. loud. He turns into the, into the road, right, with his wife and daughter in a little purple, like, Toyota Prius or something. He turns into the road, sees 20 men standing outside his house, starts to put the reverse gear in. I've heard, there he is! This probably caused him more headaches than anything the police have done in a decade. This wasn't the first time we did this to him. Yeah. <laughs> we, do, we did it over and over again. Uh, but this particular time, someone spotted him and he start, they started to reverse. Mm. And as it, it just all, all hell broke loose. I couldn't keep 20 guys yeah, was one car. disciplined at that point. Everyone just charged his car. And you can look at the footage, there's people on his bonnet hanging on for dear life. He's reversed out and he's sped off for dear life. Mm. Um, so literally a few hours passed, we'd gone back to the pub, we'd, we'd, decompressing, we're relaxing, that was brilliant. We just caused the man who radicalised the killers of E Rigby, the man who's out there on TV, on the streets, chanting UK go to hell every single day, we just ruined his evening. He had the first taste of real English opposition that day. And we all went away happy as Larry. Uh, so what happened, within a few hours, we stopped getting bombarded with phone calls getting bombarded on social media. There's posts, there's a group called, it wasn't the uh, Muslim Defence League, it was the, um, the, the Muslim Patrol, Muslim Patrol Vigilantes or something like that. Like, you go around to Anjim Chowdhury's again, we're gonna be there, we're gonna deal with you, all this kind of stuff. And it blew up pretty big, it was in the media. We went there and they fr now Chowdhury's followers are threatening us. It was all over the media. It was big news. Did you think about the consequences of that? No. As in the set? No, Did you think about the fact that they are killing people, they are murdering yeah. people? Do you not think that they might find your family's dresses? No, because we, we was in like a, we was in war mode. Yeah, like yeah. the best way to put it. Yeah, we, we, was up for, we was up for a war at that point. And uh, you think, we just kept thinking, Lee Rigby, what happens to Lee Rigby? Yeah. We've got to do something. So uh, what happened then is, we started getting threats. This, this Muslim group 
It's like saying, you go back to the house, you're going to deal with us, blah, blah, blah. So the very next day, I got the same guys together and we went back to his house. So I'm not being, I'm not being threatened by a bunch of bloody, you know, bearded savages, Islamist extremists. No, no way. So we just thought, fine, let's call their bluff. We went straight back to his house. House was empty. I got on uh, Facebook. Did he move out then? No, I think he was, he, he, he'd, he'd fled for his own safety or something mm-hmm. like that. You know, because he knew, like, all of a sudden, wow, all I'm these top. people on my doorstep, all these people mm. climbing over my cars, I'm trying to get away. So I think that he went into, he, he just went to a family's house, something like that. His house was dead for weeks after that. And then they moved him somewhere else and we tracked him down there. But what, with this Muslim vigilante group, I was outside his house and I got straight onto Facebook Live, I think it was. I said, where are you? We're here. It's been 24 hours since we were last here. You've made all these threats. We'll be here for the next half an hour. We'll see you here. Ended the live stream. Nothing. Next thing I did, uh, I said, look, I'm going to Brick Lane right now. Uh, not, not Brick Lane. I said, I'm going to East London Mosque right now. Maybe that's more convenient for you to come and confront us. This was on Facebook Live. These people have been mouthing off for 24 hours. So we went to East London Mosque. I said, I'm here. I told you I was going to be here. You're probably all living in this area. So where are you? We'll be in the outside this mosque for the next half hour. We put, we've ended the live stream. Nothing. It's all mouth, no action. Yeah. Uh, and then the following day, police came, kicked my front door off, carved me off, arrested me. They arrested you? Yeah, they arrested me for it was a harassment or threats or something like that. For Anjum Chowdhury? For Anjum Chowdhury. He'd gone straight to the police, grasped me up. But they love to use the law, don't they? They well, hate it, the law. They want Sharia law. Saying, but UK use the police law. go to hell all the time. Yeah, yeah, they're, they're yeah. holding up. Uh, you know, Muslims Against Crusades. Yeah, I yeah. think that was his, his 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 group at the time. Yeah, was MAC Muslims Against Crusades. They're holding up banners saying British police go to hell. Yeah, British. Yeah, they're trying it. Yeah. We go to his front door. We go to his doorstep and ambush him. First thing he does is run to the police. What did the police do? Charge you? They bail you? No, they bailed me Not with conditions. Any. <laughs> not to enter London, not to Shade, enter the Shades area. of what's happening to you right now. Not allowed to enter into the M25. Okay. Under any, any reason, any circumstances. Um, but then funnily enough, the day after that, he did a video. He was in a mosque, he did a video. He's like, oh, this Paul Golding, he, he uh, started, mouth, started mouthing off. Mm. But then something funny happened. A couple of days after that, the police dropped all the charges. They dropped the bell. And I said, how comes this has happened? And they said, and Jim Chowdhury rang up. He doesn't want to press charges. Oh. Okay, fair enough. I just, you know, mm. took it. So the next person after that that we targeted was Abu Isadeen. Uh, remember big that geezer, guy? Big geezer. Yeah, big. Big fella. Aggressive. Uh, he's a black convert. Big black he? convert. From Lewisham, was he? Don't know, I can't remember. He, but he confronted one of the politicians. Which politician did he confront? At the Home Secretary. I can't okay, remember his yeah. name. I think it might be Jack Straw, I think, at the time. We found out where Abu Isadeen lived. Funnily enough, through a media report. Because when you go to court, you have to give an address. You have to give an address. The address, sometimes they put it in the newspaper. So that, that was an easy picking. We found out he lived near Anjum Chowdhury. So we turned up, the army Land Rover, outside his house. There was 15, 20 of us outside his house. He, you could see his curtains twitching. He definitely lived there because we were in and asked the neighbours. We had a print out of his face, mm. knocked on all his neighbours. Does this guy live there? So we always confirmed things first. Yeah. We didn't just go in there and make, you know, make, make tits of ourselves. We, mm. we confirmed. We, we uh, firmed up on the intelligence we got mm. before we made a move. Uh, so we're outside his house. There's 20 of us. We're on the megaphone we're screaming for him to come out and face us, but he never did. And this is a big, like, he's a... Well, these are men that love death more than we love life. Yeah. Apparently. So he <laughs> never came out. We went back to his house several times, and it was, it was included in a, a documentary which came out at that time called London's Holy War, which was brilliant. Yeah, yeah. Because that was at the time when the Muslim patrols were in yeah. East London, and they were targeting people. So we went, right, we'll go and do our Christian patrols in response. So we used to go up and you down. You drove up Brick Lane. Up, up and down Brick Lane. I remember. With the army Land Rovers giving out Christian patrol leaflets. Mm-hmm. But unlike, they were harassing people. We were just telling people, be careful, watch out. Yeah, so yeah. There's, a, there's a difference. Yeah. We made that clear. But God, we went down Brick Lane many, many times, and there was, you know, we came that close to mass riots. What's the time I've seen where I mean there's thousands? Of yeah, the worst. See, people think that, you know, Brick Lane was the worst situations we got in, and they were pretty bad. <laughs> I mean, it was like 15 of us versus 400 of them, mm. and the police 
had a thin line between us. They're struggling to keep this, this horde back. Uh, but we jumped in at the Army Land Rover and went, went off. The worst situation we were, we were ever in is, and Jim Chowdhury played a bit of a blinder because we were, we were harassing him bad. I mean, he was holding protests. And all of a sudden, I'd, I'd walk around like this and say, when I say, when I shout, go, charge across the road, let's get stuck into them. And we'd, I'd walk around, getting everyone ready. And then all of a sudden, I'd just burst into it, go! And you, you can see it, we've got loads of footage of it. We would just charge, like 20 of us would just charge across the road against like 30 of them. We'd just charge across the road. The police would be rugby tackling us and they'd be desperately trying to keep order. Um, and that got nicked over and over and over and over again so many times. All of these, uh, these pictures here, for example, they're both the same arrest. Yep. This is outside the Indian Embassy on the Strand. Uh, Anjem Chowdhury and all of his minions, Abu Izzadeen, Abdul Adeen, all of them came out and they were like, Abdul, Abdul Adeen's a good example. I've never known in all my life, because I, I said earlier, I come from working class background. I grew up with a lot of travelers. We all, always used to have one-on-one -on -one straighteners. We, like, you probably had dozens and dozens and dozens of street fights throughout your life, because that's the areas we come from. That's who we are. I've never known such cowardice with these Muslim extremists. They are utterly cowardly. We would, like, uh, Abdul Adeen, he's a, he's a big, aggressive, mouthy, white convert, ginger. So we're outside, this one here, we're outside the Indian Embassy and they're all due to turn up, so we get, always get there before them. Um, and I see him coming up the road towards us. I think I've seen this, no? You might have done. Yeah, go on. Uh, so I've gone, sod it, and I've gone right up to him and I, I, I'm, you know, screaming in his face, offering him out and all this, and he's just backing up. And backing up and backing up. He's, well, he's not got all his mates world. around him, has he? So there's a video that's gone viral mm. in the, over the last week of Abdullah Dean screaming at other Shia Muslims, calling them oh, kafar. I've seen it. Yeah, yeah. You're kafar. You're kafar. Yeah. Exactly. What, are you gonna what are you going to do? 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 I've seen it, man. This what guy, a horrible rat. I got in his face and he's backing up, back all looking all bewildered. And he's he's walked across the road. The police are holding me back. And he's walked the long way round to get to. And as soon as he's in the pen of that's the true. other Islamic extremists. You, bravery somehow yeah. called him up and he's mouthing off, he's like he was in that video, mouthing off screaming, cool I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. I just said, you just, me and you are just face to face and you, you just backed off and melted. Um, and, but a, a little bit before that, there was, sometimes, you know, it, it's all fun and games confronting all these terrorists and extremists and all this. You know, it's all fun and games, but sometimes it's actually quite tragic. Why? Because... It's dangerous as well. It's dangerous, Very dangerous. for us because they could, they could retaliate because we were putting them under such pressure. And their mugs were all over Facebook and they were running off and they were, dry, they were getting ambushed and all that. So they, they were under real pressure. But that's what we wanted. We wanted to put them under such pressure. We wanted to suffocate their activities mm. so there'd be no more Lee Rigby's. That was, that was our just number one goal. And the police were desperately trying to get us to stop. Um, but just before... I got arrested at this one here, on the back of the book. Uh, I confronted an extremist. He turned up, he had the hat on, he had the, the bar for uh, the, the bed sheets on. So I knew he's waiting there. I said, are you waiting for Anjim Chowdhury? And he went, yeah. This one where you got your flag behind your shoulder? Yes. Yep. So there's a, a quite iconic photo yeah, of iconic. me holding a flag mm -hmm. with my green jacket on, confronting uh, this the black, a black, black Muslim, Muslim extremist. Yeah. Now, I found out afterwards, he was only 19 years old. Mm. His whole life ahead of him. He actually comes from, a, I think, a, a, a Christian family from Ghana. So he's got roped into all this mob. He's only 19. Uh, so I've, I'm confronting him, mm. and the footage and the pictures went viral. Back then, everything went viral on Facebook. It was all entertaining. It was good to see Englishmen Fighting confronting back, him, confronting yeah. and fighting back against all these people who are running around, causing death and destruction. Yeah. That's how we, we became a household name. That's how we, you know, we, we, we accumulated... You two, 2 million followers, no? 2.2 million, yeah, at the height of it, before it got mm. closed down. Um, so I was confronting this, this guy. He turns out to be 19. His name Brushroom Um I think it was three months later, he was all over the news, and the footage of me and the pictures of me confronting him were all over the media because he was captured by the police with a huge Rambo knife like this on his way to kill a British soldier. Uh, 
and he's now, he's serving life in prison, you know, never get out. While he's been in prison, he's hit the news again because him and another one nearly killed a, a prison guard. Um, this is in Peterborough, so yeah, you, might, yeah, yeah. You, might, you might, might ring a bell. So this, but I always sit back and think about that and I think, you know, Chowdhury is an utter piece of scum. Because he's taking these vulnerable young men yeah. And he's radicalising them with Islam. That's the, it's Islam that he's given them. Yeah. He's given the formula of Islam to yeah. fight for jihad. And then well, he, he sends call them it off. Salafist Islam or Wahhabi Islam. And he Islam. sends them all off whilst but he does nothing. Here's a 19 year old Christian fella. I, felt, I, I still feel sorry for him. You know, because mm -hmm. I'm a Christian and I try, to, I try to look for the best in every situation. I think if he wouldn't have met or got involved with Anjim Chowdhury, he'd have. He'd have contributed to the world. But there's nothing, there was nothing at that time, there still is nothing to prevent Dawa, to prevent them converting, to prevent them targeting. There's nothing. There's still nothing going on now. Christians are being targeted every day. Every day. If, if, I, if, if, if I get assassinated tomorrow or I get run over by a bus, I'll be happy because I, I know that what we did back then in the first three, four years of Britain First, suffocating and exposing and confronting and, and hunting down all these Islamists all around the country and just harassing them, not allowing them to breathe. I, I, I hope, I like to think that may have saved some lives. Mm. But dragging them out into the open in the way we did, mm. because all these videos, everything I'm saying went viral. Yeah, Millions yeah, of people saw yeah, them. I mean. It came to like three years down the line, they were all scooped up. Well, they're gone now. They're all gone. Like, they're gone. Just, I'm thinking, were we responsible for that? Mm. Did we force the authorities by shining that light on these people? Did we force them to take action? Because they're all off the streets. Like, if say we wanted to go back to doing all of that kind of stuff, we couldn't do it because there's, there's no one around anymore. There's, you get the Dawa stalls, you get the the odd extremist here and there, but there wasn't the organised networks across the country. Like there are of them. Yeah. Mm. So, I like to think that we put a lot of pressure by, drag, by shining the spotlight on them, by, by being militant towards them and harassing them and confronting them, tracking them down, going to their houses, going to their workplaces, and just- You went to run their businesses. Did they have a sweet shop? Yeah, well, uh, Abbot Isadine- Has a sweet yeah, shop. This big- Has a sweet <laughs> shop. <laughs> yeah, it's like, He's got a sweet it. shop. This, this muscle-bound, They're all laundry, anyway. They're all fronts. Yeah, so he's working in a sweet shop. We yeah. tracked him down, he's working in a sweet shop. Yeah. I went into the sweet shop and took a photo of him. Mm. So you got this, this, this gangster. mouthy gangster Islamist, this, this jihadist who's been to prison for terrorism and he's sitting in a sweet shop. Mm. And we was highlighting all of this. When and that's, you... that's, how we, that's how we became a household name. That's how we got millions of followers. That's how we got millions of hits. We became known and famous. And right. Something else you was doing at this time, which become famous, which everyone saw, you started going into mosques. Talk to yeah. me about that. Well, that was... Because that would have angered the Muslim community like nothing. Well, it angered George Galloway. I bet it <laughs> that made me happy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, go on. We went into, well, one day we went into every single mosque in Bradford. Um, and George Galloway came out and condemned us. But the reason we did this, we only did it for two months. It's followed us around like a bad smell ever since. But we, tell, me, t tell me, the, can we start on the, the one you went into in Wales? Yes. So there was, it blew up I in the media. I remember this. I remember what the Imam said. I remember what he'd made comments. Yeah, so that one, like, it's easy for the media or Wikipedia to say, oh, these guys just invade like, mosques. These guys take liberties, they go invade mosques, they desecrate Muslim holy places. Mm. But why did we do yeah, that? Yeah, talk about why. What's the reasons we did yeah. that? Um, we never went into any mosques that weren't connected to extremism. There was always, there was always some reason we went there. Yeah, we, we saw something, oh, he's hosting an extremist speaker. Like, one in North London, I remember, there was a guy um, you think how many people you've tried to get over from Europe or America for demos and stuff and like that. Them. They get stopped at the airport and turn around. Well, mm. this guy came from Iran. He was a hate preacher. I mean, he's talking about uh, jihad and uh, the death penalty for this and that and the other. He was a full-on hate preacher. He's been allowed in the country three or four times. He was speaking at a mosque in North London. We went in there to confront him. The one in Cardiff, specifically, it blew up all over the media that... Uh, the Imam at that mosque. Now that mosque was famous already because it was, uh, I think two or three of the worshippers had gone to fight for ISIS. Mm. And people, it was in the media that they came from this radical mosque in Cardiff. Then it blew up all over the media that this mosque in Cardiff, someone had recorded the, the Imam that was there 
talking about it's okay for Muslims to keep sex slaves take, because the Prophet Muhammad did it. Take non-Muslim women. Yeah, so it's all right for you to do it. Don't listen to the Western culture. Don't listen to Western values. Muhammad did it. It's okay. You can take sex slaves. This is in Cardiff in Wales, for Christ's sake, not in Baghdad or Mecca. Uh, so we thought, well, we've got to go down there and, and, and see these people. Let's go and confront him. This uh, was the one you got a ban in order over, no? No, the ban, the ban in order... Um, was in place before this. This was. This was. He wasn't allowed to go to this one. No, it wasn't. But I, I just thought it, he said it's all right to keep sex slaves. If you're a Muslim, I'm not letting him off the hook. It's not happening. Let's do it in the right order then. So you, you get you get given a ban and order by who? Well, what actually happened was is it wasn't for anything we did relating to mosques. We went to your town, Luton. Yep. Britain first. We went there with our Christian crosses. And Britain first. And you walked through Berry Park. Walk through Berry Park. I knew the boy you in front of you. I remember watching it, Imran, I knew him. I went, he was in my year at school, he was in my classes. So, and they, none of them really got involved, because I know Imran now, they're they, fighters as well. They, they, they were upset, but there, yeah. was, there, was a, there was 15 of us. Oh, no, I don't, you I, know, I was watching it thinking, Ross, it must have took them by surprise. People say what you do, like the, the, the lefties and all this, they say, you know, what you did was cowardly and all that. Really? No. We went up Brick Lane, 15 people. Mate, you walked through Berry Park, 15 people. You're, that's not counting. You know, never at any time. Because like, they come out of every shop, out of every car, out of every area. Yeah. And that's, that's what happened. Like that. And Jim Chowdhury, for example, we put him under so much pressure, he thought, I'm going I'm to play a blinder. He did, he played a blinder on us. He said, I'm going to announce a demonstration outside Regent's Park Mosque, the biggest market, mosque in London, outside Regent's Park Mosque at the end of Friday prayers. I went, oh, fucking <laughs> <no>. <laughs> that's shit. Do we go there and keep up our pressure on Amjim Chowdhury? Or get battered. And, but there's going to be what? I Thousands. think there's 2,000 capacity, maybe yeah. more. There's going to be 2,000 Muslims coming out of that mosque. My mate is a journalist. My they're, not, they're not going to be bothered that we're there for, for Amjim Chowdhury. No, they're not going to be interested. They're going to, they're going to come down and ask us. Mm. So we thought, do we want to do this? Like, we, we could end up getting killed. Like, that's, that's like 15 of us versus 2,000. That's, that's serious, serious odds. Yeah, let's do it. <laughs> There's no hesitation. He's a hero. So my, I had a lad who was from St Albans area, started doing some work with me as a journalist, yeah? Contact me. And I was always on about Andrew Chowdhury and how he's mainstream. Yeah? Don't believe that he's a little fringe moment. And then he rang me up. He went to Regent Street Mosque with Andrew Chowdhury, yeah. walking through the mosque. Yeah. And he rang me up afterwards. He goes, mate, he's a hero. Yeah. They love him. Yeah. All of them. You could see that. When All they of them were out. shaking his hand and greeting him like a, yeah. like a, like a messiah. He goes, he goes, everything you said was true. I said, oh, no. Now, when we, when we, walked, we, we always made our peace with God before we did, like, went up Brick Lane and all that, because we knew there's a good chance that we could end up getting killed. Like, this, yeah. this, that's just the name of the game. Mm. But come back to Lee Rigby. We have to do it. Mm. Uh, but Regent's Park Mosque, that was, that was a serious. But Anjim Chowdhury was trying to lure us in. So he says, why have a demo outside a mosque to, uh, uh, after Friday prayers? He knew what he was doing. He was, getting, yeah. he was saying, Golding, come and confront me and you'll see my back up. Yes, <laughs> so we was on the opposite side of the road. Must have been 15 of us, maybe 20. There was also about 15 EDL there. Mm. So they, they had a pen, we had a pen. I think it was two o'clock in the afternoon, Friday prayers ended. And Jim Chowdhury came out and he got up on a soapbox, started making a speech. We started getting all rowdy, but, but then 2,000 Muslims start pouring out, and I'm talking... I, I'll show the pictures are in here, in the middle bit. Mm. Good heavens, you, you, you just look at those photos. Yeah, there, was, there was 35 of us. If you include Britain First and the EDL together, there must have been 35 of us versus 2,000 Muslims. And directly behind us were two high-rise flats. Mm. So after about half an hour, we had 2,000 of them in front, yeah, and the people in the flats were throwing stuff at us. Mm. It, was rain, it was raining down on us, front and behind, the policeman, uh, what do they call him, a liaison officer yeah. or a Li sergeant on the scene or something like that? Liaison. When he came over to me, he said, Paul, if they rush you, if they, if, they, if they rush us, if they go for you, you, look, we won't be able to stop them, so just calm down. I went, no, we're not calming down. Um, and at the, right at the front was Anjim Chowdhury and, uh, what's his name, his bodyguard, Mikhail Ibrahim. Yep. He's, a, he's a massive muscle bound. Mixed race black lad uh, from up north. Yeah. We've got our jail up north. Yeah. Yeah, so he, he's been, he'd been on telly for be, being involved yeah, in all this nonsense. Uh, so he was uh, Chowdhury's bodyguard and Abu Izzardin as well. So they were right at the front and they, had this, like, they were smirking at us as if, you know, to say, checkmate, now look, here's this 35 of you versus 2,000 of us. 
But to be honest, like back then, we just, we just didn't give a shit. Mm. We just didn't give a shit. We, we actually, we weren't scared. Like, we, we weren't worried, we weren't anxious at all. Mm. We told the police to piss off and we started chanting and we started, we, uh, we just didn't give a shit back then. And the, the odds were staggering. When I look back at that now, yeah, yeah, yeah. as you probably you look back at some, some hairy situations yeah, yeah, yeah. you were in, what was it you doing? think, bloody hell. Mm. Like, if that happened these days, mm. we might have a different, uh, Outcome. A different reaction to it, personally. Mm. But back then, we just didn't give a shit because we were on, we were on the warpath and we, we, we didn't care what happened. Talk to, about, talk to me about Luton getting banned from the entirety of Luton. Yeah, so coming back to Luton, so... Because uh, what happened to you is essentially what's happening now, or what they're trying to do to me is, but you yeah. probably should have been a warning to a lot of people who didn't even take yeah. in what happened to you. So we went to Berry Park, we didn't do anything wrong. We walked up Berry Park, the high street. Yep. We walked up to the corner, do you know it's, it splits off like that? Yeah, the old pigeon bit in the middle of the town. You know, it goes round, it goes back. Nadine on Castle, itself. yeah. Uh, and there's a big mosque around there. That's so we went up to there, and there wasn't much reaction, believe it or not. So we walked back, we was giving out leaflets, we were like, big Christian crosses and all that, doing a Christian patrol, because Luton is jihadi central, like, you know yourself. Yes, well, Safe all Islam, it's just wall to war, isn't it? Like, you've got ginger converts down there, they're all in prison, even. they're all serving, they're all serving uh, long sentences. Mm. So, Berry Park is like jihadi central. Mm. Um, I think it's after Sparkbrook in Birmingham, it's the worst place in the country for mm. jihadis. Uh, so we thought, we've got to go there and show them who's boss. This is still our country after all. Mm. We're not going to let them rule any part of our country. So we went down there. So you imagine there's 15 of us. We had a Mer Britain First merchandise on. We had Christian crosses. Mm. We've given out leaflets. We marched up. But on the way back, things changed because, you know, it takes them a while yes, to, to, to figure out what's yeah. going on, to get their reinforcements out. And they come out bloody everywhere. Uh, mercifully, it never kicked off, but it came that close. You can see from the footage. I'm surprised, I really am surprised it didn't, knowing Luton. Because we, we weren't and shrinking knowing, violets, were and we? And knowing the lads that were there when I was watching it. Yeah. And we weren't, we, we was given as good as we was getting. So it wasn't as if we was all, you know, we'd gone there, but now we're being passive. No, we was, we was giving as much as we got. Like, mm. The abuse they gave us, we was giving back. Mm. Uh, and then the police turned up. And they ended up like hundred of about a hundred of them versus. Did the 15. police make a statement saying they're not going to be arresting anyone for any of the yeah. actions against you? People were throwing throwing things at you. People were being aggressive, violent, yeah. violent. Some of the footage we captured was brilliant. Oh, yeah. And we, you know, sometimes we do this because we want to. We want to show people this is the danger. This is what it's like. This is what it's like. Go to Luton. This is what it's like. So we went up to a shopkeeper and he's got a grocery store. And it's surrounded by vegetables. And he went, what are you doing here? We've taken over this country. It's, it's our, our country, country now. Mm. You might remember it. I remember it. And then there was a woman right at the end, a lady. Uh, she must have been in her early 20s. She came running up past the police when the Muslims are going to take over. Watch. Mm. Now, the video of this went straight up on Facebook. Got 30 million hits. It became a, a global sensation. Mm because of the way these people reacted. But that's, that's half the reason why we did it. Yeah, to show, to show them what look, they, this is what they think. This is Luton, they... this is an English town, this is Luton. This is what, this is Jihadi Central. Mm. There's people in this area, like say for Islam, uh, but Bedfordshire Police, as you probably know, are one of the worst lefty police forces in the country. Mm. They're really bad. And they- They were really bad against me. Really bad. Up until 2015 and then, they haven't given me any hassle. Well, they came out and made an unprecedented statement. That's what my solicitor said. It's unprecedented for the police to say things like this. We're not going to enforce the law, basically. They, they put out a statement to calm the community, right? Talk about the Muslims in Berry Park. And they said, it doesn't matter what any of you have done, we are not going to prosecute any of you. Yeah, yeah that's what they said. So they could have been waving knives. That's what they said. And, and that's machetes. because, yeah. You got punched through the car window as well in Luton. Well, that, that, that was in the run-up. Yeah, in the run-up. He, yeah, run he, he, he didn't get charged either. No. Right? So uh, I, was, I was in Berry Park and I drove, you, can literally get you they drive want. up the hill to Dunstable. Yeah. So I was driving up there and a, a Muslim car was behind me, erratic, telling me to pull over. So I pulled over, you know. Um, it's just up the road from where Safe Islam came up to you when you had a journalist. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, punched you in the mouth. He never got arrested. No. Well, this guy, he was a big fat Muslim. He'd already chucked beer cans at me back in Berry Park. So I stopped my car, I said, what are you gonna do? He walked up to my window Threw a punch through, which hit. I turned off the key, put up the uh, 
uh, the, the, the handbrake, and I was just about to get out, and he walked back to his car. Um, so I've got a Muslim, a violent Muslim extremist on video punching me in the face. Mm. There you go, Bedfordshire Police. I didn't do anything wrong. I wasn't, wasn't arrested. No, I, was, I, was driving, I was driving for an English town. He got no further action. I said, well, what about the video? Ow. Well, it's, it's like when I, was, when I was put into HMP Elmley, uh, years later in 2018, yeah. I was put into a prison in Kent. I was... For what? Oh, we'll come on to this. Okay. <laughs> uh, it's, it's a few years down the line. But basically, what happened was I was attacked by an Islamist prison gang in my cell. So the CCTV caught them going in the cell, shutting the door. They run out, run in, 10 seconds later. I stagger out, covered in blood. Police interview everyone, no further action. You're lucky they didn't do you, bro. No further action. You're really lucky. So it, even if There's on camera. Muslims, extremists attack me physically and I've got it on camera, they still won't, they still won't do anything. No, it's the same, so yeah, there's certain people- And they've done it to you before. Yeah, they've done it all the yeah. time. Law's not enforced. So threats to kill, you saw the red-haired bloke, threats to kill my kids. Yeah. Seeing continued threats against the family. The police literally do not arrest them. Yeah. There's literally a green pass given to yeah. anyone who wants to assault or attack you. And what they're doing there is, it's quite, it's quite simple actually. Um, you stand up and you rock the boat with the establishment. We'll let them You're on your, own. You're on your own. I stand up, rock the establishment, uh, rock the boat with the establishment, I'm on my own. You Don't go to, you, go to, you go to Andrew and Charles' house, they come and kick your door off. Yeah. But he's connected to 90, 90 terror plots. No, no. He's surrounded by people who couldn't fix it. He gets left alone. He's, he's only been put in, he got put in prison for supporting ISIS, didn't he? Yeah. But that was only years and years after, after making all happened. sorts of yeah. inflammatory statements and, and being connected to terror plots. Mm. I'm not being funny. If everyone in your team, say like you could assemble like your top and they're all 10 them people, become terrorists. all your top 10 people around you right now, and every single one of them, had, been, uh, had carried out a terror plot. Yeah. What do you think the police would do to you? Yeah, yeah, of course. <laughs> well, me. they've done it at the start, haven't they? Yeah. They'd put you on trial. And Jim Chowdhury gets left alone. Mm -hmm. um, Why do you think that is? The, the, the same, it's the think same... he works for the state? No. You no, don't? I don't. I think it's the same reason that 1,400 girls got groomed over a 20-year period in Robert. They're scared of being deemed it's racist. It's political correctness. Mm. It's woke, wokeness. They're scared uh, to deal with it. They're terrified of being called racist. So they allow them free reign. There's, you know, according to the security services, there's over 50,000 known wannabe jihadists walking the streets of this country. Mm. Over 50,000. They said, we can't do surveillance on all of them. Uh, you know yourself, we're sitting on a ticking time bomb with all yeah, this Until stuff. it all goes real yeah. bandy. Talk to me then. So they took you through the courts. After that incident in Luton, we didn't finish there. They took you through the courts. Am I right? They took you to the High Court? They yes. The so the police took you to the High Court? What happened was, immediately after... The, the legal march through Berry Park. Yeah. With, the legal protest? Yeah. When walking the when the walking down the street? Yeah, when the, giving out leaflets. Yeah. Uh, we, wasn't pros we wasn't arrested or prosecuted for leaflets, they were fine, everything was legal. Um, but what they, uh, literally a few days, they'd assured the community, we're not going to arrest anyone for anyone who had a go at Bristol first. Like, you've all got a, a get out of jail free card. You could have cracked on and done whatever you want, we're not going to touch you. Which my solicitors said was unprecedented. But then, Literally a few days after that, we get a call uh, from our solicitor. He said, Bedfordshire Police, they just want to interview you under caution about what happened that day. So he was like, right, whatever. We met them at um, Gravesend Police Station, just outside of Dartford, North Kent. Uh, straight away, we were all arrested. They, they, they lure you in, don't they? Yeah, yeah. They voluntary lure you in by saying, oh, that's just a voluntary interview. We just want to talk to you. But you've got a few questions about what happened and what, what's been said. But then as soon as we were there, bang, they arrested us. Uh, and they, they charged me with wearing an item of Britain First merchandise. Yeah, I thought so, yeah. Because, you know, back in the 30s, they there brought used in to be these... some legal rule about uh, political organisations that can't wear uniforms. Political uniforms, yeah. So they brought, mm. brought I think it's the 1936 Public Order Act. <laughs> Which, which bans political uniforms. That's, that's fine. We, we, you know, that, that's to, to stop Mosley and the black shirts. Mm. It's fine. I haven't got a problem with that. But we only had Britain First merchandise on. You know, like you used to go into every town centre in the country. We, we EDL merchandise. Mm. Well, and they're, they're trying to say that the, 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 the fleece that I was wearing mm. on that day was a political uniform. But they weren't interested in the charge. 
because it was the bowel, bowel conditions. conditions not to enter loo yeah. same again it was it was a, it was loads of bowel conditions you're not allowed to do it you're not allowed to contact anyone in britain first you're not allowed to send for emails do any do this do that it you're not a big long list um so uh, so but, you've, but the you've main experienced thing, time and time again the state using false arrests. They don't care about yeah. the arrests. It's the bowel conditions, the yeah. ba- which is what I'm going through like now. They, they, they got me on a Mickey Mouse thing, yeah, which yeah. was wearing a fleece. And yeah. they wouldn't care if they could prosecute them. Did they get a conviction on that? What I actually did, because it's such a minor offence. I mean, guilty. it's just like littering. Yeah. What I did was, at the very first opportunity, I pleaded guilty, yeah. and I had no bowel conditions. And then they got Because it was all cancelled. So I faced that now. I got like a £200 fine. Yeah. It's like, but, but yours is different right now because you, you didn't do anything wrong. No. But it's a matter of principle. I mean, you, was all, you, you went viral, you was all over the mm. news. You, you can't plead you can't guilty. Plead guilty. Tactically, you can't plead guilty no. because you're making a stand. I decided to plead guilty to a stupid offence of wearing Merton because I wanted to get back into Luton. Yeah. But what they did was they used the events of what happened in Berry Park. They applied to the High Court for an injunction. Now, I was told at the time, my solicitors, they, you know, they sit you down, they give you the, they give you yeah. the, the, the spiel, don't they? They say, look, this is going to cost you 50, 60 grand to defend. Mm. Or... Which is what they usually get you on, because then people just go... Yeah. Or you can agree to it, give them the middle finger and just not bother going to Luton. So I said, is it worth 50, 60 grand? If I lose, I've got to pay their cost as well, so that could be 100 grand. Is it 100 grand risk? Is it really worth, worth it for just going into Luton? <laughs> and we, we decided at the time it's not worth it. So we actually, most people wouldn't be in a position to fight that anyway. Yeah, we, so you have to swallow their infringement of your rights and your freedoms because you can't financially support it. They put forward the proposed injunction. We didn't fight it. We didn't, we didn't contest it, is what it's called. So then I had a high court injunction against me. Not allowed to go in any mosques in England and Wales, which they, they added, added on to it. as an add-on. Um, not allowed to go into Luton... Uh, and a, a few other ticky tack things, but uh, so what we did then in response to that, I thought you're not going to stop me going into Luton. No way is that going to stop me going to Luton. So what we did was we hired out a hotel in London, and we bought loads of electronic gadgets, cameras, radios, everything. So you imagine me we're, we're in a hotel room, a meeting like a meeting room in a hotel with a desk like this, mm. and I've got CCTV and I've got radios and all my activists went and held a day of action in Luton. But they was all wearing body cams, which fed back to my little control yeah, centre. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So <laughs> we, <laughs> we held a day of action. We, we said, you know, we, we held a day of action. We went straight back into Luton, but it was a remote controlled day yeah. of action. Uh, it was great because they were, I could see all my activists in the town centre getting loads of grief. The police were standing round. And they must have been thinking, fuck it all. And I was sitting there on the radio saying, go and do this, go and do that. And all this. So it's like a remote control day of action in Luton. But the main thing, following on from that, I was, I was banned. And this was like a year and a half after our little spate of mosque invasions. So we got this injunction now, and you know yourself because you've been done for contempt of court mm. before. And again, most probably in the future. Um, so there's, there's, you know, you can get done for contempt of court and put in prison this is if, you, if you breach the injunction. So they I'll, get a civil injunction given by a judge with no jury, then they get the injunction against you, which you can't beat or can't win because you haven't got a jury. It's ruinously expensive as well. Yeah, and it know. costs you hundreds of thousands of pounds. And then you breach that, it's criminal. Yeah. They send you to jail again for a judge, no jury. So I was banned from every... It's a winning formula. I was well. banned from every mosque in England and Wales, and I wasn't too bothered because we, it was only like, you know, two months we did that, that kind of stuff. Uh, uh, at that point, long ago. Is that when this Cardiff mosques? Yeah, but then it blew up. Mm. And there's a mosque in Cardiff. Um, and I'll be brutally honest with you, I, I'd forgotten about this injunction. Like it was, uh, it just, I'd forgotten about it. And I went to this, this one in, in Cardiff, and we just stormed in there looking for this imam. Justified anyway. Justified anyway. The imam sitting yeah. saying, telling his followers, telling his, his congregation that they can take non Muslim women as sexual slaves. They can keep sex slaves if you're a Muslim. Grooming. He's, in that's Cardiff, the imam telling in, in Cardiff you can groom, you can rape these kids. But who cares if they say this crap in Medina or Baghdad or, or Tehran, but not in Wales, for heaven's sake. So we went up there, we were determined to confront this, this imam who said it's okay to keep sex slaves. So we've gone into the mosque, um, and to be honest, I'd actually forgotten about the injunction. It wasn't, it wasn't right there at the front of my mind at that time. Um, 
But anyway, a little while after that, I was at Luton Magistrates because of the, they, they were prosecuting um, someone else in Britain first for what happened in Berry Park. Because mm -hmm. I'd, I'd escaped, I'd wiggled out of it with, just by pleading guilty, so the merchandise yeah. nonsense. But someone else was being prosecuted as well. So we was back in Luton Magistrates and the police come up and surrounded me and gave me this massive bundle of papers and said, Paul, Mr. Golding, you've been served. I was looking, I was, oh, cheers, fellas. What's all this about? So I'm, I'm peeling off it, you know, all the wrapping and all that, and I've opened it up, and it, it's all about the Cardiff and the mosque and the injunction. I thought, oh, shit. <laughs> um, but I thought, do you know what? I gave it to a security, one of my security. I said, you go and stick that in the motor, we'll deal with that later. So basically, they prosecuted me for contempt of court right. because I breached the injunction. I went into the mosque, I went to speak to the imam, even though he, what he said what he said. Um, I was up before, I went to... Uh, the Royal Courts of Justice on the Strand, the, old, the, the High Court. So I was in there, it was contempt of court. Now it was very funny, my, my solicitor came into the briefing room and he said, do you know what, it's really strange what's happened. They've brought in a judge from the Crown Court. This guy's not a civil, he's not a civil guy. Mm. They've brought him in from the, from the Crown Court for the day. And they said, this isn't good because it, you know, Crown Court is juries and serious offences. Mm. So they're used to banging people up. So I thought, well, that's not good, because they brought him in specifically just for me. So we've gone out there, we've argued our case. It was a, it was a, it was a uh, I'd forgotten about the injunction. It was a lapse in judgment. You know, I won't do it again and all that. And so he went off uh, and he came back in about half an hour later to give his judgment. And he basically said, I don't believe a word you said. I, don't, I believe you deliberately and willfully uh, broke the injunction. You knew what you was doing. You're going to prison. Um, and he said, I sentence you to four weeks in prison, which I thought, oh, that's all right, four weeks, that'll fly by. And now my solicitor turned around, because you know yourself, when you get sent to prison, when the judge is about to give you the uh, judgment, the sentence, mm. the, the court fills up yep. with... Uh, security waiting. Security. So, you hung so they all came in, my solicitor said, you're going to prison. Yeah. Uh, so I was, I was the, but then he turned around and said, what prison is he going to? He went, Pentonville. And he turned around and said, shit, that's not good, Paul. That's not good at all. I went, what's Pentonville? That's North London, isn't it? it it's basically probably, you know, the worst. No, no, yeah, there's it's, the probably wor it's probably 10 cent boy. Apart from Belmarsh, you could say it's the worst mm. jail in London. And it was. It was a fucking, it was a war zone. And the, when I moved, when I went in there to when I come out. Now, mercifully, they put me. You can't get tag either on contempt. No. No, so you're doing four weeks. Four weeks. In Pentonville, mm. and, uh, it's, it's 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 immigrant it? gangs, it's it's shanks every day. It's a war zone. It really is. It's, it's, but they, it, mercifully, they put me on the detox wing, uh, right down in the corner, and basically forgot about me. And I was in solitary confinement because when me, people like me and you go to prison, we don't go out into general population. Mm. They put me out into general population when I went to Elmley Prison in Kent, which we can come on to. Um, and within three days, I was attacked by an Islamist gang. You've been attacked Which by an Islamist gang. Which they knew was going to happen. They, 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 they know it was going to happen. They know, and then they, your last sentence, they put you into Belmarsh. They put you on a specialist wing yeah, of isolation. Yeah. Yeah. So they put us, because you know yourself, four weeks of isolation feels like a year. Yeah. Done. Four weeks in general population, if you're not attacked, you're not a target, it goes like that. Yeah, Because like, yeah. you're out there, you're playing table tennis, you're down the gym, you're, you're working. Yeah, yeah. So that goes really quick, but you know yourself, isolation is horrific. Now, they use isolation in prisons as a punishment. Yeah. But, but, but when I, 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 I... I've been in three different prisons for political reasons, and every prison I was in isolation. 23-hour bang-up. Mm. I was just in my cell all day, every day, for, it's for long, day after day, for long, week after week. It's, like you said, it's, it is long. Bob. It really does grind. It, time moves so slowly. It's only luckily when you... I was on little ones each time as well. So I thought, I'm out in five months, out in four months. Well, thankfully, that time I only got four weeks. Yeah. Which was, you know, I was. was but I was. You're just, lucky to make out. I'm telling you, you're lucky to make out. With who we are, you're lucky to make out. Well, the first thing and they, they did. That. The first thing they did, and when I look at it with hindsight, the first thing they did, because now I've got the experience of Elmley and Liverpool prisons mm. and so on, the first thing they did was chuck me out into a packed canteen in Pentonville. They chucked me out. They said, oh, you've got to go and eat, go and get some food. Into the canteen, I was surrounded by. Uh, blacks, I was surrounded by Muslims, 
beards everywhere, little hats, you know, the little hats the Muslims wear. I was in the middle of, I was, I was just sitting there like this all the time. I thought, this is going to, just any moment now, there's going to be a hundred fists coming from every direction. And then I was just eating my meal like this, like looking around. You, you know yourself, you've yeah, been there. It's, it's hard work, isn't it? It's yeah, like, it's not good. You, any moment like that, bang, you're in the you're middle of the wall. I just back to the wall. Always have back to the wall. Stand my back to the wall the whole time. And uh, so, but they threw me into that canteen when I first got there for an hour. And now, but then they put me on the detox wing. And I think, why did they do that? Why did they throw me out into, why did they put me in isolation on a detox wing, which is like, you know, just well out of the way of everyone. It's well out of the way. So it's like I really quite put him in a, a quiet corner of the prison. But first of all, they put me into that, ca that canteen amongst all of them. Mm. I'm thinking that was quite malicious because they did exactly the same thing when I went to Elmley and I've got, I've, got, I've got a Let's sustained get, injury. No, yeah. saying, go on, stick him out and get his food. He's got to go get his food, see what happens. Because they can justify, they can say, if they're a, before a judge, if something terrible happens, I mean, they say, oh, we was giving him some food. Yeah, yeah. Bang, I've been attacked and so on. Um, mm. But yeah, I did, a, I did four weeks in Pentonville. That was my first taste of prison. And that was... What it, year was that? It wasn't like the physical danger part that bothered me. Uh, you know yourself, it, it's not... You, people like me and you, we come from rough areas and we're up for a row, we're up for a tear up. We've had probably dozens, hundreds of fights in our young lives. That's not what bothers us. We're not shrinking violence by any means. Mm. But it, when they put you in isolation, you can look at your... You can, you can look at the time, can't you? And it's like one o'clock. And then you watch TV and you're bored. You might watch, read a bit. You, you look at the thing again, it's only half one. Time goes so mm. slow. It's just slow, slow, slow. And it's day after day, week after week, and it grinds you down. I remember when I was in Woodhill, it was Christmas time. It was Christmas. And I was in Woodhill and I was put down the block. I was transferred from Bedford block to Woodhill block. Woodhill was maximum security. So I was treated as a first come in as an ACAP prisoner. I was in for a mortgage fault uh, as an ACAP, pr ACAP prisoner. And when I got into Woodhill, I had no, there was no TV down the block, yeah? Because certain jails don't have electricity pits down the block. Yeah. So there's no TV. I remember not knowing, actually, because it used to get dark so early, I remember thinking, well, I've got no idea of the time. Well, there's no clock in it, so I've got absolutely no idea what the time is at all. I wouldn't have known if it was three in the morning or seven, eight at night. I had yeah. no idea, man. It's hard work, and, isn't oh, it? It's long and the thing is, when, when I find, when I first go into prison, mm -hmm. because, because out here in the wild, we're running at 100 mile an hour, there's millions of things going on, you, you're pulled in every direction. Mm -hmm. As soon as you go in there, the first week, I usually sleep about 14 hours a day. And then slow down. Time goes quickly, mm -hmm. because you're just sleeping, sleeping, napping, sleeping. Your body thinks, right, we can rest now. And it's, mm -hmm. it, it, it was quite overwhelming. The first week in Pentonville, I just slept. I was like hibernating. Uh, and then, and then it, uh, you know, I, I stopped needing to sleep and then it just became boring. Mm -hmm. Boring on top of boring, on top of boring, on top of boring. <laughs> and it, it, it was, the second time I got sent to prison was even worse because it, it was twice as long uh, and I was actually put down the block for a lot of that. What was the second sentence for? So, uh, a few years after that, uh, shortly after Donald Trump retweeted us, and that, that caused, I remember that day because you, you actually let us know about it. Did I? Yeah, mm. I, don't, I don't know if you can remember that. You actually rang up and said, oh, guys, Trump Donald Trump. Trump's just retweeted you. Yeah. So we've gone, what? And he bang, bang, he's retweeted three videos. Of course, a massive diplomatic That's international... Massive parliament, wasn't it? It was crazy. We got condemned by the EU, we got condemned by Parliament, we got condemned by the, the Mayor of London, we got... It was crazy. We, we got accused of wrecking the special relationship between Britain and America. <laughs> uh, that's how seriously they were taking it. Mm. Um, so yeah, that was, that was crazy, that was. Shortly after that, we became aware, we were based in Kent, and we became aware that there was an underage girl, about 15 she was, and she'd been out drinking, she was a little drunk. She walked into a kebab shop to ask for directions, she was lost. That's what I got done for contempt of court for. So she, uh, and the, the the guys that, basically, the guys that were running the um, kebab shop were illegal immigrants. Mm. And they seized her, dragged her upstairs, and just gang raped her for hours and hours and hours. This and then a, every one of their DNAs was found on her. Yeah. This was a 15, In every hole. 15 year old English girl, been raped with, to within an inch of her life. One of them left. One and, of them and went, like, went to Italy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And like you say, unbelievably, they were bowed. They were allowed to return to their kebab shop. No, they, just, they changed the name. They changed the name of the shop. Because you know what I've done? When I heard about it, I went straight down there 
And I went to the business next door. I said, any schoolgirls been in there? She said, uh, yeah, why? I said, so schoolgirls are going in using this business because there was a school at the end of the road. I was like, what the hell? So that's when I went to the court case. And then the, I went to the court case at three o'clock in the afternoon. I stood outside waiting for the blokes. I wanted to get pictures of them so I could start pumping the pictures around the neighbourhood. Mm. So I went to get pictures of them. And then the police... Yeah, because I think we was both on it at yeah, the same both on time, time. Yeah. By the time I got home, I got raided. Seven in the morning, boom, my door went in. I got yeah. dragged before the court. You, won, you made a video on the steps of the court yesterday on your phone. Yeah. So, yeah. They can be three months to spend the sentence. Yeah. What we did was something different because uh, we actually, because we were quite good at it, we tracked down where these guys lived. Mm. And we thought, what's the best thing we can do here for the community? Because all these guys, I mean, their DNA was found... Oh no, all on, of them. on this girl. They're guilty. I could right? not believe as far, the as, case. as far as I'm concerned, they're guilty. They're guilty, man. All right, your mm. DNA doesn't, you know, it just it doesn't. All six of their DNAs. Yeah. So what can we do here? They're at large in the community. Let's find out where they live. Let's go and warn their neighbours. It's the best thing we can do. Let's go and warn their neighbours that they've got this. You don't know how many how many mothers and fathers have got young girls going in, in the shop. Road. Do you know what I mean? So we, we've got to do something about this. So we, we went to that kebab shop and, and did a video and confronted, tried to confront people, but it was all locked up and all that. But then we, we found out where they lived. And we went to their, the roads they lived in. We had a special leaflet made. So say, I, I don't know, they live at number five. We leafleted everyone in, that, in the road saying, be careful, there's a sex pest, a rapist, paedophile, because he was underage, so he was a paedophile. Mm. Uh, a paedophile, migrant, rapist, gang rapist, living at number five. Just be careful. Uh, and then we went to his house, and he's not banging on the door, uh, trying to confront him. Uh, and we did this. So a week passed. We put the videos up online. A week passed. We lived in Kent at that time, in the town of Tunbridge. Not Tunbridge Wells, the one next door, Tunbridge. So we're living there. We're driving through a country lane. And all of a sudden, bang. The police car in front, police car behind, police cars up the side. The police cars everywhere. We're surrounded. It's like an SAS ambush. It's like, what the What's going on here? So we've pulled over. We're looking in every direction. There's police all around us. They all jump out. There's like 20 police officers around us, just like that. It was a real precision operation. Mm. Um, so they've arrested us, confiscated our phones. Little did we know, at the same time, they were raiding the house, carted away everything. Every USB stick, every laptop, e everything we used to run Britain First. Printers. On, on what charges? Printers. You know, it, everything. They took everything. Um, so when they, they questioned us and we said, yeah, we, you know, we did it and we're proud of it. Well, what we did, we warned the neighbours that these scumbags lived in their well, communities. More to the question, I kept saying, why were they on bail? Why did you let them out? When you let them out, one of them fucked off straight out of Europe. You don't your... usually get let out. Not, and that's, not when you've got a DNA, DNA matches. Yeah, if there's DNA, they don't get let so out. So as the judge, I kept saying when they come for me, I thought, it's because of your failures. We're now highlighting your failures. You've, let, you've allowed the children in this community to continually be at risk by these rapists. You fucked up. So yeah. now you're fucking us. Yeah. But then you've gone. So they'd arrested us. They'd taken us to Tunbridge Police Station. Uh, they kept us in for 24 hours. They questioned us. And they charged us with religiously aggravated harassment. Religious, now they would say that <coughs> what they did was, was quite clever. <coughs> they got the wives and girlfriends yeah, I read it. of the gang rapists yep. Acting like they to were make targeted. statements. So that the target, because it would have looked bad. If it was the rapist. If it was, I don't care. I, I happily went and harassed a load of gang rapists. I'm happy to do that and everyone would have been on our side. So what they tried to do, is say, no, you harassed their girlfriends. No, we, we didn't go there, we didn't mention the girlfriends, <coughs> we didn't know the girlfriends lived there, we didn't know anything, we didn't even know the girlfriends existed. Right, so why, why were you telling us we're harassing them? But that's what they did. They tried to make it seem as if we was harassing women. these innocent in girlfriends. Homes. Muslim women in their homes. They yeah. were petrified. Well, one of them wasn't even Muslim, and she stayed with him. She stayed with him even after he was uh, convicted. And when, when we say convicted, they all got 20 to 30 years, yeah? Yeah, they've got really long so all the, so And yeah. what, what happened to you for the crime? Uh, so, <coughs> yeah, they prosecuted us. And the original paperwork, which I've still got, it details all of this in, in, in this book. The original paperwork had the rapist's name on it. Mm. So we was like, do you know what? If you want to prosecute us for harassing a bunch of rapists, migrant, paedophile gang rapists, Go ahead and do it. We're up for that. Um, 
And then a bit, a, bit, a bit later down the line, they changed it to the girlfriends. But then we went to court, and it was this, this slimy, middle class, <coughs> you know, and, and the Attorney General of the Conservative Party government got involved in that case. The, Conser the Attorney General, who is a political appointee, he's a, he's a politician, he's part of the Tory government, sat down with the judge in our case, and he basically, he told him, these have got to go down. Because what they was doing is... Was they it was Jeffrey Cox? It might have been. The same Tommy General who called the cases yeah. against me. It might have been. I can't say that for certainty, but it was a Conservative. It was under Theresa May. It was Theresa May was Prime Minister. I bet it was Jeffrey Cox. He's the one who made the charges come against me each time. But what they were doing, we didn't know at the time, they were setting us up for anti-Muslim hate crimes. Now, that's the way the media framed it, anti-Muslim hate crimes. Where's the hate crime? Where's the anti-Muslim? These guys are migrant gang rapists. Mm. All their DNA was found in an underage child, right? We went and warned the neighbours. Where's the anti-Muslim hate crimes in all of this? Nonsense. Uh, but that's what the media spun. Uh, so we came to trial, we was found guilty. No surprises there, no shock. Um, I was sentenced to nine weeks in prison. And I was, that evening I was carted off to HMP Elmley on the Isle of Sheppey in Kent. Nine weeks in prison for putting a warning leaf in it for a man who was the week later convicted of gang rape of a child. Yeah, it was like a, a, a couple that, of weeks. It was like literally a, a yeah. couple of weeks and these guys, all of them were found guilty. Every one of them. Of paedophilic gang rape. It is, you couldn't make it up. It is unbelievable. Uh -huh. yeah. But the way the media presented this to the people and, more importantly, to Facebook, was that we had engaged in anti-Muslim hate crimes you and we'd been Facebook. sent to prison. Now, I was sitting there in prison. Is this what got rem you removed from Facebook? This was what it was all about. It, was, it, was, nothing, all that. it was nothing to do yeah. with what we did or what the... They didn't care. They didn't care. This was to get us closed down on Facebook. This was a pretext... To justify it. To, sen to censor our Facebook page, because we were... You know yourself, it was 2.2 million. It was the biggest political Facebook in the country. It was more than all the mainstream political parties combined. It was bigger, and it was re we were reaching more people than the BBC every week. It was massive. It was, a it was a real thorn in their side. So they concocted all of this, so they could go to Facebook and say, look, they've been convicted of anti-Muslim hate crimes, they're both in prison, close them down. So I was sitting there in HMP Elmley. As soon as I got in there... It sounds so familiar to what they've done <laughs> with the, um, when they sent the red-haired bloke to my house. Then they used my reaction to it to get me removed from YouTube. Exactly. Again, yeah, it was the government. It, Again, it was the government. It's the way they all operate in unison yeah. to, to get us all censored and closed down or banged up or demonised. Mm. They all work together. That's why we call them the establishment, mm. you know, because they're all, they're all the political elite. They're all in it together, the journalists, the politicians. Mm. Um, but I, was, I was straight into HMP Elmley, which is a rough prison on the Isle of Sheppey. Uh, I'm put onto the induction wing. To my astonishment, I, as soon as I went in there, and you've probably done this yourself, I said, look, unless you give me my own cell, I'm going to recruit an army. I'm going to recruit an army in here and I'm going to cause trouble. <coughs> and I say that not because I'm going to recruit an army and cause trouble, because I want my own cell. Do you know what you have to say? You have to say, whoever you put in my cell, I'm going to kill. Right? I'm homophobic, I'm racist, and I wet the bed. Yeah, you have certain guidelines who say, if you close that cell door with another prisoner in it, I'll kill him. And yeah. I promise you that. Is that the trick you tried? But then, they, yeah. then you're on your own every time. You have to do it. Yeah. Because you know, I can't. How am I meant to sleep knowing that he yeah. might take money to do me in my sleep? And it's not past these these, no. these bastards. No, anyone to put you in. They could put you in with a non-Muslim. With a bearded Muslim. But they could put me in with a non-Muslim, and he's going to take money to do me when I'm in my sleep. Yeah. So my thing was shut the door, and they tried it once. On the, they put me into Winchester, and then about two hours later, I'm, I'm in my cell, and it's got another bed there. But each one did, and then they opened the door of another prisoner. I said, I'll kill him. Yeah. I will kill him if you put me in that cell. Well, I, I just tried. I didn't. Mm. It, it, I, I, I just said to them, look, if you, if you put me in with anyone, I'm, I'm basically going to recruit my own army in here, <laughs> and I'm going to cause loads of trouble. And they said, all right, Mr. Golding, you've got your own cell. I was like, but um, oh, did it work? Yeah, it worked. Oh, yeah. Sound, it worked. Yeah. It, it worked in uh, it worked in Pennantville, and it worked in uh, Elmley as well. Yeah, I've, I've only ever had my own cell. So I was three days into, Pen uh, into Elmley. Mm. I was sentenced to nine weeks. Which is not, not particularly long, but the problem is the isolation. It, 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 you, can't, you can't explain to people, you can't emphasise to people that nine weeks 
in isolation is like two years. Oh, I've got a year coming up and I know I have. Oh no, it, it's fine, my head, bruv. It's, it's so bad. The isolation is so bad. They use isolation as a punishment in prison, but they give it to us as standard. And even as a punishment, they're only allowed to do 28 days. You're only yeah. allowed to do 28 days on the block. Yeah. You're not allowed to do more than 28 days. Because of mental health. Three days into mm. Elmley, I was on the introduction wing. There was two bearded Muslims on the introduction wing. There was, uh, there was only about 20 people on there, but two of them kept eyeballing me all the time. Eyeball, 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 big beards. So I went to the prison staff. I said, look, guys, I don't give a shit, but these guys, they're eyeballing me. They're staring at me all the time. Something's going to happen. Mm. And I was like, all right, Mr. Golding, we'll relay that to the, uh, whoever, the higher up. Uh, the very next day, I'm sitting there. Uh, so if you imagine, I'm sitting there like this. The TV's here, the window's there, my bed's here. I'm sitting on my bed, I'm e eating my lunch. I'm watching TV this way. I hear bang. I turn around, those two bearded Muslims are in my cell. They've closed the door. I go like this to get up. You know, you know, it just happens so quick, yeah, yeah, yeah. like nanoseconds. Yeah. And you just, you, you, you're confused, you're dazed, you don't know what the hell's going on. As soon as I get to, to get up like this, the one who's closest to me is an Iraqi asylum seeker, just right hooked me directly on the nose. Now, you've probably taken a punch on the mm. nose before. It, it disorientates you, mm. massively disorientates. So you've gone from peaceful eating your lunch, turning around, bang. Because he punched me on the nose, it was bleeding all down. I was, covered in blood, mm. right? And I, I, I don't know what happened, but I, I, I started to come around to get up and they basically just opened the door and ran out. They ran back to their cells. So I've staggered out of my cell. This is all on CCTV. I've staggered out of my cell. And I'm looking <coughs> around, there's no prison officers anywhere. None. Like, so I'm staggering along, all on CCTV. Is there cameras on the wing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. there's cameras there's everywhere. Some, in Woodhills there's not. But there's cameras everywhere, you can see them. They're like, the, you know, the, they've got like the encasing, haven't they? That like indestructible concrete encasing. But, you know, I've staggered along and then one of them see me covered in blood. And oh, quick, 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 everyone. Um, and they were locked down. Uh, but then Kent Police came to see me. I think it was two months later, I was out of prison. Um, I get a phone call, no further action. So, how can it be no further action? They're on video. For heaven's sake, I sustained injuries. Uh, so it, it was a it was a sneak attack by a, a Muslim. You're, you're lucky though. So was that on the induction wing? Well, one of them. Because if it had been on the main wing, they'd have been able to plan it properly with tools, weapons. Well, what happened next? Killed. What happened next was even worse, in my opinion. Mm. But when they came in my cell, one of them had a pen like that. Mm. You know, they hold a pen like that. Yeah. So I thought I'm going to have to fight for my life here. Like this is serious. But I was I was so disorientated by being punched in the nose. It just, I was, I was in cloud cuckoo land for a good 20 seconds. Um, thankfully, they ran out. Uh, but the trial, no charges, no prosecution, nothing. Okay, so next thing they do is they take me from the induction wing, which is like, you know, spur A, and they take me around the corner and put me on spur B. So I'm on there, and about eight white fellas come up to me. Oh, no, yeah, because I've been all over the TV. They'd been watching me on TV, yeah. and they knew I was coming to that prison. So this was like a few days into it. And they said, don't worry, we've got your back, all this kind of stuff. Then the, the prison officers came in and put me in my new cell. So I'm starting to arrange it and clean it and all this. But the, they'd locked the door after me. And then one of these guys who'd expressed support said he'd look after me in there. He came down and said, listen, Paul, I've got to tell you, the Muslim lifers, two, two landings above, they're up there and they're talking about coming down and killing you. So I was like, mm, what do I do here? Do I just, just get stuck in or... So yeah, because life as will. Yeah, they've got nothing to lose. So I thought, do you know what, just, tell, just see what happens, tell the prison officers. So I went and told the prison officers. I didn't know who they are, I wasn't snitching, so I didn't know who they are. I said, I've been told by someone in here who said they're going to watch my back. That the Muslim life is up there plotting, already plot, plotting who's going to kill me. Like they, they wanted to go for me, they was going to, they was going to do something. So what they did was they locked me down and said, we'll be back. Then, so I'm sitting in the cell and I, I hear banging on the door. So I've got up, went over to it. You know, you've got the little slits. Yeah, yeah. There's like four Muslims there, four Muslims. Uh, yeah, why you lock the door, bro? All this, Self are you cowardly? I said, I need to lock the door. Open the door right now, mm. see what happens. Uh, you know, bravado. Um, 
But then they all walk off. Oh, I know all these feelings, man. We, I know. You, you've been in that prison. It's not good, bro. Like, as I thought, I've got Muslim lifers upstairs. They've just come to my door. I've got a few boys there who've come up to me and said, you know, fuck, that's we support first. you. Surprise, we, we support you. We're going to watch you back. But the, 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 what, uh, a team of prison officers, they locked down the unit. They locked down the whole spur. Then they came in my cell. They said, get your stuff ready. We're going somewhere else. I said, oh, really good, put me somewhere. They must have known this was going to happen. That's, of course why, they did. Why, why let it happen on the first They did it deliberately. Yeah. yeah, they've done it deliberately. They know what's going to happen. It's like you, you the, I've read in your book that they mm. put you in a room with them, with a bunch of Muslims. What did they think was going to happen? And then locked the door. So, you know, uh, next thing you know, they've taken me out, they've taken me off this spur, they've, they've walked me like three miles to the other end of the prison. I said, where the hell are we going? You're going to the block. So the way you go for punishment. They've put me on the block. Not for being attacked. Yeah. So the, but the block is punishment. They're the most disgusting, run-down, horrible cells. There's no radio, there's no TV, there's nothing. Mm. It's a punishment it's cell. Punishment. So I've gone in there and it stinks. There's bits of food everywhere. There's no TV. There's, there's nothing. Uh, they left me in there. It's rock hard. The bed's like a mat, isn't it? Yeah. It's not like a bed. It's like the, 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 police, the, police, station. Like the police station cells. The blue yeah. mat. This, like, this. It's like I, I ended up, getting bruised. Yeah, I ended up yeah. getting bruised in all my, my side, so I couldn't lay on that side. Because I was in there for five months in, that, in, in the block. Yeah. Five months, bro. So it's, it's a lump of concrete with a, a little blue mattress on top. Yeah. So that was, that was hard, sleeping on there. It's not comfortable. I, I, I stayed shoulders. in there for a week with nothing. Now that really pushed my endurance to the limit. Mm. A week of four walls. I mean, that is, that is, that is real hard work. Mm. That is real hard going. It doesn't sound hard work. I try explaining it to someone. Go and lock yeah. yourself in your bedroom and don't come out. And yeah, that's a nice bedroom, yeah? Yeah. Nice bedroom, nice comforts. Just go and do that for a month. So there you go. Yeah. You'll come out and you've you, you, you lost your sanity. I mean, you, it, it, is, it is a punishment. Let's see why they use it in jail as a punishment. But they're still only allowed to use it for a few weeks yeah, in jail. Yeah, I think like a week maximum. Yeah, 28 days is a max to yeah. do down the block. After that, you're so up. I did the full 28 days in the block. Yeah. But after the first week, they gave me a TV. Okay. Um, you're lucky certain blocks don't have TVs. No. Access, so you they had to bring a TV specifically. But I mean, you don't have the the block. certain blocks that have the aerial points. No. I've been around when I've done M loads. Mercifully, this one did. You're lucky, yeah. And then after a month, you know, I was, I was in, a, in a routine. Mm -hmm. I was quite happy where I was. Well, yeah. you know, do the next, next five weeks in here, mm -hmm. it'll go quickly. It'll go quickly. Uh, so I was settled. And then I was fast asleep. Six in the morning, bloody door comes. What? Flying open, loads of prison officers come into my cell. I'm like, what the fuck's going on here? Mm -hmm. uh, they said, right, you're being transferred. Get your stuff ready. You've got 20 minutes. I was like, well, I'm quite happy here. I said, yeah, but you can't stay here. That's because you're not allowed, legally allowed to. No, you're not legally. I never knew that. I never knew that. I was, I was hoping they'd just leave me there. It was disgusting. Mm. It was dirty. It was filthy. But hopefully, I was, I, I was, I was, you know, I was happy after being there for four weeks. I was, I was settled in, bedded in. So they said, you're being transferred. Well, being transferred where? They said, to another prison. Oh, fuck. Now that, that, you you don't, people at home can't appreciate what the kind of anxiety that creates. Mm. That's bad in itself. Where am I going? Where am I going? What now? Am I going to be put on a normal wing again? Am I going to get yeah. attacked again? We'll go like, through the same process. All this, right? So they've, I've got my stuff. They've, they've taken me out to the, 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 the reception area of the prison. I've jumped in a car, a special car, you know, with the locked doors and it's... Mm. The, the, the bulletproof windows and all that mm. kind of stuff. Uh, four prison officers with me. I'm all uh, handcuffed up and they transfer me. I said, guys, where are we going? They said, you're going to Liverpool. I said, you're not going to enjoy it there. It's gang warfare. I was like, oh, fuck. <laughs> That's all white, sir. I didn't know about Liverpool. Okay, go on. I thought I was walking into another war zone. Yeah. I was actually, on the way up, this is, this is, this is, do you know when sometimes you think back and you think, did that really happen? Mm. Did that really happen? So I'm on the way up, and they said, do you fancy a drink, Paul? I was like, yeah. This was about halfway up, so about like Coventry on the M6 or something like that. I said, yeah, I fancy a, like a Dover drink and a toilet and all that. So they pulled into a services. You imagine the scene. You imagine being in a motorway services, and the prison officers are, dr are, are leading a prisoner whose legs are chained, yeah, yeah, yeah. his arms are chained, you know, like a slave. I say, McDonald's of stuff. <laughs> Just get me a double bit. Get I said, I'll go to the toilet, now I'll get a drink. Give me a double quarter pound. I was thinking, did that really happen? Like, I can't imagine the scene. A motorway services, and I'm being paraded through it mm. to the public. 
in chains. Crazy. So then we've got all the way to Liverpool. It's a long drive, it's boring. Uh, we've got there. Mercifully, that prison was almost 100% white. It was, it's a prison that's closing down. So it's like 170 years old, so there's cockroaches, it's horrible. The Victorian ones. It's a shithole. Oh, right? Bedford. But it's half empty. The prisoners that are in there, local scouts, car thieves and burglars and stuff like that, no one recognised me because by this time, because I've been moved around so many times, I couldn't consolidate the increase in my weekly shop canteen, which means that by this time I had a massive beard like this. You know, like when you come out yeah, of yeah. Belmarsh, you had a big, big beard. Yeah. Um, and you do that because you, they don't allow you to increase your yeah, to canteen. Yeah. To be honest, oh, you're not allowed them down the block. You're not allowed shaving. When, you, well, when I was down the block, you weren't allowed shaving. I, I didn't know that. No, for security issues, because they have security. I said to you, but I'm not down the block for those reasons. Yeah, I'm down the block because you're making me down yeah, the block. Yeah, I was down the block because I got yeah, attacked. You've made me come down the block. They, well, we, have, we have rules down the block. There's no shaving razors, there's no this, there's no that. I said, yeah, I understand that for the people who establish everyone. Yeah. But what about me? No, but yeah, but uh, so I got there and they put me in my cell and uh, it was actually, it was nice and chilled and relaxed. And I was actually in gem hop, mm. but I was, you know, right down the end of the landing. There must have been five empty cells either side. I was pretty much isolated on my own. And again, I was still banged up for, I think, 22 and a half hours a day. You know, when the door opens, get out your door, man. Like when I was on general pop. You know, when you're on a, when you're in prison. I've never waited myself. When you're in prison, you've got 30 quid to spend. Yeah. You don't want to spend 12 quid on a razor, do you? No, no. You'd rather buy chocolate and, and crisps and, and sweets yeah. and stuff. You, this is why you come out with a big beard, I come out with yeah. a massive beard. We look like a pair of converts, but mm. when you're in prison, you'd rather gingery. spend that money on food and, and snacks. Well, time... Space Raiders, mate, I used to buy about 20 packs. You know, your Haribo. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, your Haribo, your Space mm. Raiders, your chocolate, you know. And phone. And you go through it in a phone day. Phone for me, phone if I could. Yeah, you go through it in a day, didn't you? It's, it's, you have to wait. But I, I spent the next five weeks there and it was quiet, it was chilled, it was relaxed. It was very, no fights, nothing. Was, they're closing the prison down soon, it was mm. half empty. Um, so my day of freedom came. I was like, yes, let's get back amongst it. And I was looking forward to freedom. Because when I was in prison for that long, Britain first had collapsed and there was nothing left. I mean, like it, we'd gone back to square one, it'd been just a name on a website. It was, it was dead. The email list was there, the was website Facebook was gone? there. Facebook, or ev Facebook, everything had been censored. How much about how hard hit is that? When you lost your Facebook page? Yeah, I mean, you, you, you just- how much work you building, just, you, you put into building up? Like me, me, yeah, we put years and years of hard work in. Years of hard work. We got up to 2.2 million and then they just closed, they just take it off you, didn't they? Mm. Um, but How disheartening is that? So I'm walking out, my dad had driven from Kent to Liverpool to pick me up. I'm coming out the gates, I'm looking forward to seeing him, and I finally get my freedom. Because you only do nine weeks, it's halfway point. So I was released on licence. Um, so I'm looking for, I'm going out the gates, I can see the sunshine ahead. And I'm going out there, and my dad, I, I can see my dad and every, all of a sudden, 15 police officers get out of three cars. And then, Mr. Golding, can you come here a sec? I was like, what the fuck's going on now? I thought they were going to rearrest me and recharge me with something with bowel conditions. Get your rest. And they said, we're SO15 Counter Terrorism Command. The same guys who prosecuted me for the anti Muslim hate crimes. These are the Britain's elite terror police, focusing their attentions on us, politicians, political activists. So no, no wonder jihadists are running rampant because they focus their, they've been told, focus on the far right. So they, they focus, so SO15, not just like two or three, 15, SO15, counter-terrorism command officers have, have, have me, met me at the gates of Liverpool prison. And they've said, you're not going home. I said, well, what's happening then? You're going to a probation hostel in West London. How? I was like, what are you talking about? I've done half, I've done half my sentence, I'm off. I'm, I'm free. I said, no, you're going to a probation hostel. Oh, bro. I was like, oh. you know, your whole, you, what an anti-climax. Yeah. Like, what a disappointment. So, I jumped in the car with these officers. My dad, my dad, my father hasn't got a clue what's going on. He's sitting there waiting for me to come out and I never materialise. He doesn't find out for two days. Unbelievable. Oh. So they're driving me back down to London now in the pretty much the same manner as I was driving up to Liverpool, you know, with, with the authorities uh, taking me there. So they've taken me to a bow hostel. 
Which is just gonna be full of wrongs. In, in Ealing, in West London. Multicultural, trendy, liberal, it's a shithole. Um, so I've got there, it's full of, it's, the, the, they use probation hostels. So like you, you're committing murder, you've gone away for 20 years. Okay, you you back come out, you, you've got no home, your family have all drifted away, you've got nothing. So they put you in a probation hostel to help you. Why the hell, I, I was only in prison for nine weeks. Why are they putting me in a probation hostel with a bunch of murderers and, and gang rapists and, and massive drug dealers and all this kind of stuff, served really long sentences? The whole place is covered in CCTV. My license conditions, can't use any electronic devices, can't do Britain first, can't speak to anyone in Britain first, can't do this, can't do that. It's like this long, it's like an encyclopedia. They've put me in this probation hostel at halfway point when I should have had my freedom. They've put me in there to prolong my, to prolong my misery. Yes. That's it. Yeah. They can keep an eye on me, make sure I'm abiding by my bowel conditions. But just that little bit longer, mm. just to piss me off. I'm in there a month. Um, oh, now, why I'm in, this is funny, why I'm in that probation hostel in Ealing in West London, uh, I get told that Tommy Robinson is filming outside Leeds Crown Court. Is that when this was? He's filming outside Cre <laughs> Leeds Crown Court and he's been nicked and he's been put in jail as well. And there's demos, there's demos oh, that that kicking off and everything. Now, I've actually, uh, my brother came up. He, he quit his job and came up to look after me every day because it's a shit old area, it's a bad area for, for, for a far-right extremist. So I, I had to keep the bloody, I had to keep the Islamist beard for an extra month. Like was, it was literally like this. A lovely looking brother. Like a lovely looking brother. Um, so he's come up there every day and we're driving around and, and one day we, we go somewhere and we notice these massive lorries with these huge screens on and some guys hanging around them. So we, this was when it was all kicking off for you. I said, well, he's... I went over to these guys, I said, what's all this for? And we're going into London, it's a free Tommy demo, have you seen what they've done to him? I was like, oh, all right, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so while you was in prison, yeah. uh, they took you to Onley, I think it was, wasn't yeah, they? Yeah, they did, man. I was in the probation hospital, oh. it was like that sort of time. Um, after a month, they released me, I went back to my mother's, because I had to get rid of my house, because I was away for a long time, couldn't pay for it. Just before we got sent to prison, mm. uh, the Britain First payment processing system got closed down, literally a few days before. So I went into prison with everything collapsing. Like all the bills, Facebook's gone, everything was switched off. I came out, Britain First was in ruins. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, yeah, that was when you was getting tortured. Yeah. You know, the, the, there was free Tommy demos everywhere. And um, I just set about very diligently rebuilding Britain First from the ground up. And it took us, took us about six months and we was back in business. Mm. We had a new payment system, we had loads of, act, loads of activist branches everywhere. We was causing havoc all over the place, all over again. Um, but yeah, that was, that was the last time I'd been to prison. Shortly after I came out, I sat down and I thought, I've got everything I've been through. We've only touched the surface, we've only scratched the surface. Oh, mate, I know. It's like By the way, I've gone through re the questions I can put to Paul. We could probably do a part two, part three. We probably could have done it like that. And you know yourself, you've written two books about yeah. your story. It's, it's difficult cramming it all in, yeah, isn't yeah, it? Yeah. Even in a podcast, but in a book, it's difficult. But I wrote this book, and it, it forensically details everything, plus plus ten times more than what we've spoken about in this podcast. Yeah, there is a lot more. There's a hell of a lot more, because we've only touched on a lot of the yeah. actions. We've only you've done, done a, hell of a, couple, of a couple of hours. Yeah, you've done it, a lot of actions. Where can people buy this, buy this book, Paul? Well, just on the Britain First website. Which is? Uh, Britainfirst.org. You can yeah. search for it on Google. You know, it's just on the website. You'll find it. Um, but it is. Where can people follow you? It actually stopped. It actually stopped five years ago. Well, so, this book. So you need yeah. to do an update. So I'm going to do an update this summer because uh, I'm going to do an update every five years. There's enough's happened in that five years. Rebuild, rebuilding Britain first. More arrests. More persecution. More bowel conditions. So15 harassment. Loads of stuff. Like I say, we could probably do a second part of this yeah, just yeah. on the last five years since I came out of prison. The yeah, last we, time. we will. We yeah. will. There's Let's so much it. to talk about. I think you know we've been where, going. Um, where did you? Now. Where can people follow you? Well, since Elon Musk has uh, bought Twitter and renamed it X, he's restored. He restored our accounts quite a lot earlier than than your one. You was you was okay. like one of the last ones oh. he restored. But oh. I, did, I did say to you, didn't I? I said, just be patient. Yeah, it yeah. will happen. I had a gut feeling it would happen at some point. What's your Twitter handle? 
uh, if you type in Paul Golding, Paul you can't Golding, Golding, you can't search band. No, because it's, it's got the affiliate badge with Britain First. Britain First has got a gold tick. You, you can easily find any of our accounts. That's our only platform. That's our only outlet. Uh, and What's it, the future for the next 12 months for you? Well, in the next Are four weeks. Election? Yeah, in the, in the next four months, yeah. we've got a parliamentary by-election. Because we, we fought the Electoral Commission for four years to become a registered political party. They rejected us, rejected us, rejected us. We had to drag them all the way to the High Court until they finally registered us. So we went through a massive battle with them just to be able to stand in democratic elections. Uh, that was two years ago. Since then, we've been standing mainly in local council elections and parliamentary by-elections. And we've, we've, we've got some great results for a you know, new kid on the block in politics. Like we contested the Tamworth election like two or three months ago, Tamworth by-election. We defeated the Liberal Democrats, the Greens, UKIP. Um, in local elections, in various, we've beaten Labour, we've beaten the Conservatives, we've beaten Reform in various different seats. So for two years, we're doing pretty well. But in the next four months, we've got a, a parliamentary by-election in Wellingborough, which is it's good territory. It's working class, it's patriotic, it's pro-Brexit. So I think we could do well there. Um, we've got the London mayoral elections. We're going up against Sadiq Khan. You're going to stand? I'm not standing. No, Nick Scanlon, who's our uh, South East Region organiser, he'll be standing. I don't live in London anymore. Okay. So I can't stand. Um, but I stood, I stood against Khan in 2016. You might I remember, remember you the video of me turning, turning my back, back to him, and it became yeah. an international sensation. So much has happened. You, could, you, you know, what we've we've only scratched the surface in this podcast. We tried yeah. to cram as much into two hours. So if you, you know, if people want to see the full story, I at bet least it's nearly, that, I bet it's nearly three hours, isn't it? Yeah, I bet we're at three hours. Two and a half. Two and a half. So, could, could do a part two you in a future. You get easily, yeah. Yeah. But yeah, we've got loads of elections this year, loads. And the, the, like you say, the political sands are shifting. The tide is turning. Can you see that? Do you see that in your own day to day when you go about? Yeah. Do you see in the, in the how people react to you? Because yeah. I see it every day. Get noticed everywhere I go. Um, mm. It's not just that. It's just you can, you, you know, family, friends, you hear, uh, just everyone. Uh, every family member I come across now is just that straight away they launch into politics and they're complaining, they're moaning, they're whinging. Yeah. People I meet on the streets, everywhere. You see it in pubs, in cafes, everywhere. No one's happy, are they? No, no. no. Everyone, everyone knows it's wrong. Yeah, everyone knows it, but 70% uh, of people don't vote at the moment. Turnout's gone right down to like 25, 30%. Need to get involved. Um, so, so hopefully in the future, if people got something worthy to vote for, mm. and like I say, it's different now. Because back in the British National Party days, they never had social media. They can never fight back against media smears. But we can now. You've been reinstated, we've been reinstated, we're reaching millions of new people. We can fight back against the establishment now, against the lies, the poison, the demonisation. Mm. Uh, and, and we can use social media. I just hope that uh, they don't take out Elon Musk. Uh, it brings the, the whole thing crashing down. I hope that... Uh, Will Trump, do you think Trump wins in 2024? Yes. You do? Uh, I think with the trends, the polls, what's going Flans on... Flans Belang win in... Um... In Belgium? I'm not sure. I, I mean, I, I I, I, I've been to the Belgian Parliament before. I've met Philippe de Winter, yeah. but I'm not too sure about what elections they got come up. But your friend, Gert Wilders, just yep, won a spectacular on. video uh, victory in Netherlands. Mm. Yep. And we've had the, the big success in France. Trump's going to retake the presidency next year. The Danish People's Party, Swedish Democrats, uh, the Vox Party, Maloney, well, not so much Maloney in Italy. She's a bit of a disappointment. She's a bit of a total disappointment. But, but she was voted in on that ticket, so, so the voters are there. The voters are right wing. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, you can point to her victory and say Italy's going right wing, even yeah. if she's betrayed. Yeah, them. yeah, once she's gone. Uh, the voters are still voting in that way. So, you know, our politics is on the rise throughout the whole Western world. Mm. It, it's, everything's cool. going in our favour. It's been enjoyable, bro. Yes. And I wish you luck, man, and safety. Yes. Because you're um, going to need it. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I think you're going to need it more than me this year. <laughs> <laughs> I know. It's going to be a difficult year, but uh, thanks. Uh, it's if been you, a pleasure. If you're just watching this, you know we're silenced most places. Please share it, like it, and stick in your WhatsApp group, send it to your email list. And I thank you for taking the time to watch this podcast and join us for the next one. They're out every Thursday. Thanks. Carry on watching for more interesting guests. I'll talk to anyone. I'll debate anyone. I'll hear anyone's story. If you want to help me along that way, it's not free. I need your support. If you can support my family, that gives me my peace of mind. It means I can continue to do the work I do. You can do so at www.supporttommy.com. I appreciate every bit of support, as do my children. It gives me the ability to fly them out here to see me so I can stay in constant contact with them. I'm de-platformed and I'm censored, so I need you. I need you to share this content. Make sure you stay tuned for upcoming weekly guests, interesting guests. 
exciting guests. I'm Tom Robson, and this has been my podcast, Silenced.